Well, a good Monday morning to you, and thank you for joining us here on Real Talk. Can you believe that it is already December 21st? December 21st, Samuel G. Brooks. It is the week. It's actually winter. It is winter. It's yeah. winter today, right? The solstice upon us, and it is my parents' 46th wedding anniversary today. So Bruce and Catherine Jesperson that are Aww, tuning in. Happy anniversary. Happy, can you believe it? They're tuning in live from uh, from Calgary, Alberta. They don't miss a minute of real talk. And uh, so excited for them. Uh, th- that's one of the... Can you imagine? Uh, that is a, like right between the milestone of the 45th wedding anniversary and the 50th. Every single one of them still would feel monumental, wouldn't oh, it? I know what you mean. I, I remember my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary. And like that was a huge affair. And that was, uh, I think, like 15 years ago. That yeah. Was like, yeah. Did they throw the big to-do, have the big party? We uh, we had the whole family go to Jasper for it. And we Ooh. had a big, uh, we had a big shindig, shindig out there. So that was a lot of fun. Fabulous. Yeah. Well, well, uh, mom and dad will we'll owe you a big celebration for, <laughs> for 46 and maybe we'll just 46. Seven will do it up big time. Uh, in just a second, we're going to check in with uh, Chris Henderson. Chris is the chief strategist, uh, partner at Y Station. You know, Y Station is the official research and strategy sponsor of Real Talk. And uh, you have been participating, uh, closing in on about 500 of you as part of our Real Talk panel. We're getting people together that every week answer our question of the week, and it gives us a, a really great indication of where you're at, of who's watching and listening to the show. And, and of course, it directs, uh, to a certain degree, the content on this show, which is a good thing. It means that you're having a say in what you're seeing and hearing discussed here on the program. So we're going to get into some of the data on what you're telling us about your your holiday shopping routine and how COVID. I'm going to ask Chris to take a look back as well at, at, at the, the question from the week prior to that as well. With, with COVID upon us, I think we asked you specifically, how is your holiday routine being impacted? And then we've got our question of the week ready to go, our third one coming up, and we're going to tell you about that. That in just a moment. I love the yes, we're going to be panel. talking today. Yeah, we're going to be talking today, obviously, about mm-hmm. about the the arrest. The, the, the people are saying the kid. He's not a kid. Ocean Weisblatt, the young guy arrested by Calgary police who who threatened to tase him uh, over the weekend because he wouldn't get off the rink. He was at the ODR, the outdoor rink, with his friends and. And I see that, that this has become quite a polarizing uh, subject. People throwing a bunch of hypotheticals in there, which I think makes for good conversation. You know, uh, for example, what would have happened if he was a person of color in this situation? Other people are saying, well, well police clearly overreacted. The F-bombs, the threats to tase him. Other people are saying uh, when police decide to uh, to impact an arrest and you resist arrest, uh, newsflash everybody, that's what happens. So we're going to get your take on that. I haven't checked, Sam, our, our YouTube live comments, but I would suspect the minute that I said Ocean Weisblatt or the minute that I said arrest in Calgary, people probably started chiming in with their opinions. We'll be keeping an eye on the Real Talk RJ hashtag as well. You can let me know how you feel about that story. Calgary City Councilor Jody Gondek is going to join us just after the 9 o'clock break for the headlines. Uh, she posted something pretty powerful on her social media yesterday talking about the, you know, these, these uh, soldiers of Odin, they call themselves, you know, these basically like white nationalist racist groups that, that parade around, you know, you've heard like the proud boys and the three percenters and all these guys that walk around uh, basically trying to intimidate people, trying to, trying to sort of infuse fear into their communities. Well, uh, counselor Gondek yesterday, Calgary city counselor tweeted, you know, I've been strong through this pandemic for my family, for the people I serve and for myself, She says, I'm broken today. She tweeted this yesterday. I'm broken, she says. Soldiers of Odin walk the streets of my city filled with hate for people like me while so many silently watch it happen. Uh, Says the counselor, speak up, stop the hate. If not us, then who? We thought it was a good time to reach out to her, so she's going to join us on the show in about a half hour's time. Uh, we'll ask her about that. We're, We're going to get into some of the sort of the polarized nature of communication, it seems, politically and otherwise. In the province, I'm going to ask her about that arrest. Calgary police, obviously, their actions being called into question. We'll get her take on it. I have no idea where she's going to land on that. Uh, and, and obviously, we're going to ask her if she's going to run for mayor in Calgary. Everybody's wondering who's going to win. It's a wide open horse race. It looks like it in Calgary and Edmonton, in, in Alberta's two largest cities. Uh, mayor Don Iveson on this show announcing he will not seek re-election. Uh, mayor Nahed Nenshi, unless he's done it in the last ten minutes, has not made the announcement down in Calgary yet. But many suspect. Uh, he kind of, he kind of. Well, I can't wait to ask Henderson about this when we bring him in in a second, because Chris Henderson, that's that's part of his jam is municipal politics. We'll see if, <laughs> we'll see if he finds it to be a fair assessment that Mayor Nenshi eked out a win last municipal election. But do you remember that Bill Smith kind of hot on his heels down in Calgary? Bill Smith was the preferred candidate. It seemed. 
of Calgary's uh, business community. I remember, I remember I was at a Calgary Flames game uh, down in town. I got to sit in the stands and just enjoy the game. And uh, and Bill Smith had wraparound advertising uh, all around the rink, and people were going, oh, yeah, Flames ownership's big on this guy because they thought that he'd be the guy to get their arena deal done. Uh, do you remember? It was it was. It was I, I can't say I follow Calgary municipal politics as closely as I follow Edmonton's. Yeah. Um, I remember Bill Smith running, and I remember sort of the divide between that. I mean, like, Nenshi had finished his third term, I believe, already at that point. Yeah, that's Because right. he's on his fourth now? Yeah, or? he's on his fourth. He's on his fourth, yeah. So, I mean, like, Nenshi's such a beloved figure in Calgary, too, but, I mean, well, you're right. He kind of— he he he, he, yeah? he has been. Mm-hmm. He has been. A be- he's beloved among those who love him. <laughs> yeah, there, okay, there's that's the first fair, yeah. of what I think will be many profound statements today on the show. Those who love him, love him. But but Nenshi also is, mm-hmm. hey, and it's and you know it's tough for a multi-term mayor to maintain. It's it's very rare that you know is it Hazel? I'm going to blow Hazel's last name. Is it McCallion? Who is it out out in, in Ontario? I think not Hamilton. What am I? You know who I'm looking for? Mayor Hazel. If we just Google Mayor Hazel, I, I bet you some of you are, uh, which many of you deserve points uh, here. Real talk points because Hazel McCallion, yeah, uh, mayor of Mississippi. Saga. Uh, she served. Get this from 1978 until 2014. What? <laughs> she was the fifth. She was the fifth mayor of Mississauga, Ontario. That's why you go. Mississauga's only had five mayors. Well, yeah, that's because Hazel McCallion was the mayor from 1978 uh, until 2014. Uh, uh, well, and she, Mississauga gets just kind of swept up into Cal- into Toronto politics. So, yeah. like it's, it's but she's a she's yeah. a force. Of, she's a force no of nature. Kidding. And the thing is, like, yeah, you could probably find somebody that like can't stand Hazel McCall. I've been, ever, you know, ever since you know seventy eight, I've been telling people she's no good. You know, there's probably people that can't stand her, but but her her story, uh, her legacy, very rare. Uh, you, you don't typically see politicians maintain that type of popularity for. For decades, it's very unusual. Uh, so we'll see. So with regards to Ned Nenshi down in Calgary, you know, it'd be interesting to see if he could win another one. You also have to wonder with with mayors like this that have, that have you know, he's what would he, he win that whatever competition? You know, someone sort of named him like the best mayor in the world or something like that. And there, you know, it was a response to you know how he it was reflective of how he responded to the the Southern Alberta floods uh, mid last decade and and those types of things. And, and Nenshi was very celebrated, right? And he was speaking all over the world and. Um, to to try to maintain or sustain that type. Do you of... remember naps for Nenshi? No. On Twitter? Oh, because Nenshi just wasn't sleeping during the floods. Okay. Like he was, he was always on. He was always making announcements. He was yes. always wheeling. He and did. Dealing. He did an amazing job. Yeah, and 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 I remember very vividly. Uh, trending on Twitter was naps for Nenshi. Like Nenshi, go take a nap. Everybody okay, so wanted him to go take a nap. It wasn't. It wasn't people dedicating their naps to Nenshi. No, no. Okay. It was. A, it was a call to action for Mayor Nenshi to finally to, rest for a minute to start taking naps. Like I commanded you to do on Friday because you couldn't chill out. Can you tell? We're, we we got to get. We've got Henderson in the right now in the bullpen. And he's ready to go. And we're ready to start the show here eight minutes in, Sam. But just very briefly, um, for people that that follow us on Twitter and, and those of you that don't, what are you even doing? Um, you, you wouldn't, I, I was punching, you know, the Slack channel we have. It's how we communicate. It's how we share information. I was punching some stuff in uh, because the work never stops here on Real Talk. The work never stops. And on Friday afternoon, I'm punching some things into Slack. I was confirming a couple. I, th- I think I'll. I think I'll announce here what I was confirming. You got a you little can, bit excited. You can. I got excited about this. Guest. You got excited. I, I. I was punching into Slack to give us the heads up that coming up on December 29th, uh, we're looking forward to a one-on-one exclusive with Dragon. Arlene Dickinson and I was excited that Arlene's going to come on the show we're going to talk you know business and life and and all these types of things and uh, you got pretty excited and you were like woohoo you responded within eight seconds of me entering the information to be fair I was out walking my dog and I have slack on my phone I was like queuing up a podcast to listen to while I was okay. walking and it just popped up on my phone okay so it was somewhat serendipitous that this information was presented to you but still so I responded to Sam Stop working. You know, it's like a command. Like it's, it's an order. It's stop working. Relax, Sam. You're doing You're, you're like Nenshi during the floods. Oh, we're going to give you some sort of a hero complex now. You're not going to be able to get through the door. And then, and then the next thing you knew, and I wish we had the video queued up. I didn't, I didn't know we were going to get to it. Uh, you, 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 you had sort of started entertaining yourself in the back alley. What exactly was going on there? Okay, so if you look at my Twitter at Samuel G. Brooks, um, nice plug. You, yeah, well, it's it's where you can find this. There's a ridiculous video of me skiing behind a snowblower. That's that's what happened. Um, what I was actually doing that afternoon was trying to fix said snowblower. 
uh, for my dad. And uh, yeah, I just got it at a point. <laughs> I got to this point where I realized it wasn't fixable. And then I was like, I wonder if the motor's strong enough to pull a person. So I first like rode it around the garage a little bit. And, and that was kind of funny. And then, then I decided to ski behind yes, it because so that would just were. be some good lulls on Twitter. Like that, that, that was the entire point was to make some people laugh on a Friday afternoon. Okay. Well, it worked. And you did an amazing job. It made it just made me wonder what what sort of how your neighbors see see the like you know who is this guy? He's Maureen. He's in the alley again, and he's got his skis on. What What do you mean, Gerald? Yeah, he's got his skis on, and he's behind the he's behind his snowblower, and I don't know. He just came from Real Talk, so he's probably been drinking. All right. We want to remind you as we kick off this, our fifth broadcast week. What? That this wouldn't be possible without the support of our presenting sponsor, Bitcoin Well. And you're now at the point, it's December 21st, and you're like, what am I getting for my loved ones? What am I getting for the person that already has everything? How am I solving this dilemma to get creative? Well, here's the thing. You present a gift as though you've been thinking about it for months. So as your loved one pulls the card out of the tree and they look at you with that gleam like, what is it? You know, that pressure you feel every time someone's about to open a gift from you and you're like, I hope it's good. You're like, I should not have put in the $15 gift card to Starbucks. That is, they don't, they're not jazzed about it. They have 34 of them in their bag already. They open it up and what? A gift card for Bitcoin? I didn't even know there were gift cards for Bitcoin. And then you go, yeah, I know. And I've been like keeping an eye on it all year. And I thought of you because I know how you're into all these interesting things and where the economy is going and finance and cryptocurrency. And I just thought it would be so, especially because it's like way up there now and what an investment. And I just thought of you. And then, so I went to Bitcoin well in the next, and then they're like, you are, that is so thoughtful. That's incredible. Everybody else is giving me these lousy gift cards for Starbucks and wow. And then you, you know, I mean, if you had music behind you, it'd sound a lot like this, wouldn't it? As you walk around the house. Do, do you just want a soundtrack behind you when you walk around? Topping up your coffee again, just feeling pretty good about giving the gifts that people actually value at Bitcoin Well, the presenting sponsor of Real Talk. Let's move, Sammy. Real Talk starts now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Well, you know that we're very proud to have Y Station on board as the official research and strategy partner of Real Talk. It means that we get scientific polling from you, from this audience, uh, that gives us a very clear idea of how you feel or what you intend to do about issues that matter to you. Chris Henderson is the chief strategist and partner at Y Station. And he looks like he's settled right into his Monday morning, set to go, my man. Welcome to Real Talk, making your debut today. It's good to have you here. Thanks very much, Ryan. I'm really excited to be here. Okay, so you've done many things in your life. Uh, one of those things is uh, steer campaigns. As a matter of fact, you've managed successful municipal political campaigns, including for uh, Edmonton's now mayor, Don Iveson. Let me ask you about what Sam and I were just waxing about uh, down in Calgary with regards to the head and Would you say more and more difficult to win elections once you get into your fourth, fifth, sixth term? Does the public fall out of love with with politicians or maybe are, are there instances that that you can observe in a municipal context that might set themselves apart from other levels of government yeah i think oh sorry actually i was listening uh to the intro and then she's in his third term is he I mean, his third, third, third term, term you're correct oh, yeah so he's okay yeah, so he everyone's would, would, seeking a fourth term pardon me pardon me he'd be seeking a fourth term right right right, right, right. he's got down. one up on iverson right yeah. He's one. He's one term ahead of yeah. of, uh, of uh, Mayor Iveson. Yeah. Okay, got the, it. it. It becomes increasingly difficult after I find after the third term. Uh, this isn't the case in Calgary. Calgary's had mayors that have been elected to a fourth term uh, before, but um, Edmonton's never had uh, a mayor elected to four consecutive terms. Interesting. People usually decide to to uh to take a walk after the third term here or or they get sent packing 
What do you think it is? Is it just that, like, take take us into the, the psyche of it, and I'm not saying take us into Don Iveson's brain or something like that. Generally speaking, like, as a politician has to, I mean, unless you want to take us in there, but. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, so I'll, actually, I want to, I want to just actually disagree with something you said earlier. Oh, please do. Well. I, I actually don't think it was particularly close between Bill Smith and Nahid Nenshi. I think it looked close. Yeah. I think that it's, I think that it, people wanted it to be close and there was a lot of chatter and there was a whole bunch of shenanigans around, um, around some of the polling and, and whether it could be believed or not. But I think that Nenshi had a pretty, a pretty healthy lead most of the time. Yeah. Uh, I think voters wanted to tell him a thing or two about, you know, like, I don't, I don't know, like, shape it up a bit maybe but uh but i don't think he was really in much danger i think they ran a very good campaign in calgary uh to get they added some things in the for the third campaign that uh that i think they really needed that they didn't have in the previous campaigns but the big difference and i've always said this between calgary and edmonton is that in edmonton you get elected with you know 65 percent of the vote and then the next day, people are like, okay, show me. In Calgary, you know, and you got to earn that in, in, in Edmonton. Every day, you got to kind of earn it again. Uh, in Calgary, you can get elected with 35% of the vote. And two weeks later, you can have an 80% approval rating. In Calgary, you win and you're the, you're the, like, you're their guy uh, until one day you're not. And then it's over for you. <laughs> so, uh, so I think there's, there's this interesting broad acceptance. It's, I think it, you know, it's kind of like if you talk to anybody from Calgary about the stampede, you know, like the, the worst opinion you'll hear about the stampede is like, it's okay. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, everybody, it's like, it's kind of agreed in Calgary. Like we all love the stampede and that's what we're going to tell yeah, fair. everyone from outside Calgary. Okay. So yeah, you know, I mean, I, I'm I even think thinking back Chris to, I'm even thinking back to, to growing up there and so I didn't grow up in Edmonton. So I, I please correct me if I'm wrong. I, I could be wrong here, but I don't really remember an Edmonton mayor. And again, my memory's limited, uh, but I don't remember an Edmonton mayor, for example, with an endearing nickname. Uh, but I mean, I grew up Ralph Klein was my mayor, Al Dur, Dave Broncagne down in Calgary, but he called him Bronco. He's like Ralph and Bronco. And, you know, these I, Edmonton's maybe even treats its mayors a little bit differently. I mean, we used to call Bill Smith smiling Bill Smith. Did he like that? Yeah. You know, I don't know. I don't know if they, we were making fun of him. It or does, not, yeah, it doesn't sound like a compliment. You know, actually, the person who I remember now, actually, I had a former professor who I won't name because they're long gone now, but uh, at, U, at the U of A, who had a very unkind nickname for any man. Actually, no, you know what? I, I'll, I'll say the nickname because I can say it on the show. Uh, any name, any mayor of Edmonton, they called Mayor Num Nums, and uh, and they were they were, they, I mean this this professor hated every like not hated but d disliked every mayor Edmonton ever had uh, you know since Horlocks. So, uh, but yeah, it was uh, I, I yeah other than smiling Bill Smith, I can't uh, I, I always wanted to get uh, Iveson. I, I always thought Hot Donnie would be good, but. I don't think I don't think he'd like that. It's uh, hot, Donny Iverson. Smile and Bill lived down the street from me when I was a kid. Really? We didn't we didn't call him, oh. but Smile. I just knew that the mayor lived down the street from us, and that he had a pool in his backyard, and that's all because I knew about he, him. He, he had that Jeep Grand Cherokee with Mayor Bill Smith on the side. He had like he what? like fully had his and, car. and yeah, the yeah. gold license plate on the front that said Mayor and the gold license. Yeah. plate, yes, yes. And the gold are you license, being yes, serious? So. Yeah, dude. Mm -hmm. um, in so I lived in like Twilliger area um, when I when I was growing up, and Bill Smith lived down the street from us. And I do remember like his big black SUV rolling down the street, and it said, uh, "I don't even remember the lettering on the side so much as I just remember the front license plate was just gold, and that's, it said Mayor." That's incredible. Did he drive? Yeah, it was very. Did he yeah, drive himself, or did he have a tasteful. driver? No, no, no. He drove himself. Did you say that the, the I remember we used to, I used to commute to, to school and I used to smile I used to wave at him and he'd just smile and wave back, you know, smile and smile. And so he so he, he did you say the writing on the side was very tasteful, Chris? Is that the word you used? Yeah, it had the city crest and it said Mayor Bill Smith. It wasn't like, you know, big block letters. It was just on one of the doors. Just so you knew it was his car. How interesting. You know, don't 
don't tick it. it don't well that's yeah, what it looks that. like to me. That that's what it looks like to me is and, and I'm not I'm not saying like don't read too much into this. I'm saying hypothetically, a mayor that would have their information on their vehicle would, in my mind, be doing one of two things. Number one, finding some shady loophole uh, under which to write off every expense affiliated with the vehicle. This That's, is sounding very Mayor sound, Quimby-esque. Sounds to me, it sounds to me like sort of number <laughs> one, the city's going to be paying for this vehicle. And number two, it sort of feels like sort of a check stop strategy. Although it could be, it could work the, it could be a heat score. It could work the opposite way. If you have an officer of the law that's not enamored, that doesn't fall into your 80% approval, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, he, um, th but that was back when council had a car allowance. Oh, so like it was so, this, so, so it was, it was on the up and up. He's like, damn straight, I'm spending my car allowance on, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. on no, gold no, no, lettering like, and gold license plates. City paid for it, uh, I think, to a degree. Yeah. And uh, that was that was part of the, I might still be part of the com council compensation package, but I it, do you it definitely feel like, used to be. Do you feel like uh, politicians, uh, Chris, by the way, it's 851 for those that are watching and listening live. I promised you by about 858, we'll get to what we've set aside a half hour to talk about. Don't worry. Sure, um, I'm, I'm, very, I'm happy to talk. With. Do you, this seems to happen on Real Talk. We had Natasha Kornack here for a while ago, former UCP staffer, and Natasha and I were to talk about young people and uh, non-compliance to COVID protocols, which actually would be a fitting conversation now based on what just happened on that rink down in Calgary. Anyway, Natasha and I didn't even get around to it. We spent a half hour talking about the Alberta legislature and what it was like to be a staffer there. So we meander. This is what happens when people have coffees and wine and beer and they just they sit around and they chat and they explore ideas. Do you believe, Chris, that politicians and, and we can talk at the different levels of government, but do you believe that they're well compensated enough uh, this is a, it's it's going to flare up in debate again. It does every time there's an election. It does every time people talk about what politicians make. Everybody says they're overpaid. A lot of people say they should just do the job for free. I don't think, as a matter of fact, especially at the municipal level, I don't think they're well compensated enough. I'm worried that we chase people away that aren't wealthy enough to sustain themselves. In other words, they still need a paycheck, uh, but they wouldn't consider council because they wouldn't get paid enough. And I think it keeps some really good people out of the mix. What do you think? Uh, I think counselors are probably pretty underpaid. Um, you know, aside from all the media, like all the council meetings and all the like, all the constituent stuff that you have to do, there's there's quite a bit of dancing bear routine involved in yeah. that. In, in the council, in being a counselor, I think counselors are probably uh, fifty thousand dollars a year underpaid. Yeah, um, I think the mayor is pretty well compensated. I think you could probably go as much as a quarter of a million for a year for the mayor if you wanted. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, on the provincial level, <clears throat> the, I mean, the provincial level, you get paid more if you're a cabinet minister and you get paid more if you're on committees. And I think it's off and, the top uh, of my head, it's like 125 grand for an MLA, something like that. It's like 165, off the top of my head, approximately about 165, 170 grand for yeah. minister, ministers. And then I think Premier makes uh, whatever it is, like 225, I mean, 230, 250, something yeah, like that. Yeah. I don't think that I don't think that's chump change. Uh, maybe could be a little bit higher, but uh, you know, at, at some point, yeah, I think you have to really strike a balance between making sure that you're paying people in a way that you're compensate. Sorry, that you're attracting good people. Yeah. Uh, but not paying so much that you're not attracting the wrong kind of people. Yeah, fair enough. Um, hey, let's let's dive into this. Let's just do a hard swerve before we start getting into the data uh, of what real talk audience members are telling our show and are telling Y Station uh, where you are, Chris, obviously, is the official strategy and uh, polling partner, uh, research and strategy partner of Real Talk. Can you explain to us what this panel is, uh, what the goal of it is? And, and for those that are tuned in right now that have not yet signed up, explain to them why they should immediately Sure. Um, so we run a, week, a question every week with uh, for the for the Ryan Jesperson show. Uh, people go on, they take it, and then at the end they have an opportunity to to opt in to get the question sent to them every week, rather than having to go through Ryan's Twitter or or through the website. Um, uh, and that helps us understand uh, all kinds of different questions or all kinds of different information about the audience, so that we can tailor new questions we can um we can ask you questions about other civic issues if uh, if you want uh but it really it just makes sure that we're taking the pulse of your audience every week and on, on some of the like you know and sometimes we'll do i think 
you know, Ryan and I, you and I have talked, sometimes we'll do slightly harder hitting issues. Sometimes we'll do slightly lighter issues, but it's really whatever is relevant uh, every week. But why you should, uh, why you should sign up? Well, uh, if you sign up for the panel as a whole, you can earn points and you can get <laughs> gift cards and the, and the like uh, over time uh, with the more, uh, more surveys you do. Um, but other than, but the real benefit I think is that you get to be a, an ongoing and structured participant in yeah. real talk. That's my thing is like, these are, these are, you know, I, I mean, I can think of so many different, uh, contexts in which people have said, you know, mainstream media doesn't reflect the population or the shows that I hear, or the shows that I watch or the podcasts I see available to me seem out of touch or, or they don't have their finger on the pulse of what's really going on. And this to me is like. Uh, the people, you know, have a voice. This is the people's show. So I feel like I'm going to do start breaking into the character, into the rock on WWE. But but uh, it's the people's podcast. It's the people's show. And this is the way that we ensure that that happens, Chris. It's exciting, man. There's like hundreds of people that have signed up already. Yeah, hundreds of people. I think almost 500 people took the last survey. Yeah. Um, what was super impressive was, so I, you know, um, my colleagues, don't always love this, but I'm a big fan of the open-ended answer. Yeah. You know, like in, in a lot of our work, we take thousands of open-ended answers and we read them so that we can sort of determine what the insights uh, that people, people are really feeling are rather than just looking at some of the numbers. The numbers are really valuable, but the, it's really great to, to read what people are, are, are thinking and, and see some of the emotion behind what they're saying. So on this last survey, we had about 500 people that responded. Uh, and I think 100, uh, I have the exact number here, 150 of them left open-ended answers that actually uh, offered you more than just, you know, a click of a button. They actually wrote something out. Well, uh, and I was really, and, and, I, and I always find that those open-ended answers tell the story. Let's let's get into this, Chris. We've got sort of like five minutes ish. You want to hit the headlines around nine o'clock. We've got sure. Counselor uh, Jody sure. Gondek. But uh, the question of the week coming up right now, we obviously don't have results. It's just gone live at Ryan dot com. Uh, what impact did 2020 ultimately have on you? Chris, those open ended answers are going to be amazing as we'll review those uh, in days to come. But why don't we get into our last question? Our last question basically had to do with the impact of COVID and, and, and people's holiday shopping routine and how it was impacted. Generally speaking, what really jumped out at you? Well, what really jumped out at me about this is that people are really trying as much as they can, on, even under some financial stress and even under the, the, uh, the restrictions that we're under, under with the, the most recent lockdown, people are really trying to, to buy local. Uh, you know, they're buying from their favorite brewery. They're buying from their favorite cidery. They're buying from uh, their, um, you know, restaurants that they like. They're going to small shops. They're buying gift cards. A lot of people are admitting I had to do some shopping at Amazon, but I'm doing as much as I can. Uh, online, local, curbside, if I can, if I can go into the stores, I can. Uh, and, you know, even though, uh, you know, it was interesting because about 20% of people said, oh, I'm just buying everything local. But then when we, again, when we went to the comments, that's where we saw the story saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to put every dollar I can it, local, but it's just, you know, it might be just too hard or I can't get out of the house or I can't do, I can't do a lot of the stuff you need to do to buy local or I don't, or I just, you just don't have the money or they're sending gifts to, uh, to loved ones out of town. And it, but it, I am really feeling that, that buy local. And you've got a lot of people around town encouraging people to buy local. You see it all over your social media. Uh, Linda Huang's been doing an amazing job running around telling everyone like how they can support local, whether it's to pick up their, uh, their skip the dishes or sorry, pick up their takeout orders or, uh, whatever it is, there's been, uh, I think, a real sense around this holiday around the um, the importance of that. Yeah, no kidding. I'm, I'm just reading through these answers, and, and we'll sprinkle these in through the show today, but but uh, you know what? There's there's two recurring themes I think, Chris, as you touched on. One of them is is the local trend, and the other is people pointing out, like, I mean, you know, one listener here or one viewer here says, you know, I've been out of work for four years and eight months. It's another modest Christmas. I mean, like that's the type of thing where you just go, ooh, like you know, I mean, first of all, that's the real value in these types of 
uh, answers uh, that paint a real clear perspective where people are coming from. Also, though, what a, what a reality check on some, some people. I mean, you know, you might say 2020 has been a tough year for a lot of people. 2020 has just been, you know, just yet another year that they've uh, faced and, and, and continued to stare down these challenges. And so if that's you this morning, uh, shout out to you and more power to you. Um, Chris, we're going to we're going to move on. I look forward to talking with you again soon, my man. And thank you so much for the work. We're really, really thrilled to have Y Station on board as a partner. The value here with regards to scientific polling is uh, as far as I'm concerned, and I have done some digging. I think it's unprecedented uh, when it comes to a show like this in Canada. So uh, really looking forward to this partnership. Well, we're glad to be a partner. Thanks, Ryan. Have a great show. That's Chris Henderson. He's chief strategist uh, and a partner at Y Station. You can find our question of the week. And it's set to go right now at ryanjesperson.com. Again, this one, I'm really interested to see how you're going to respond to this. What impact did 2020 ultimately have on you? That's a big question. We'll get to those, you know, those types of uh, thought exercises through this week. And next, we are going to be doing shows up to and including Thursday morning of this week. That'll be Christmas Eve morning. We're going to do a show. Sam and I will obviously take Christmas Day off. And then next week, we're running through it again all the way through till Thursday. Next Thursday's show, Christmas, or rather New Year's Eve morning, is going to be a special show, and we're going to announce that a little bit later on in this broadcast. Uh, we talked about Mayor uh, Bill Smith, former Mayor Bill Smith's Grand Cherokee. Can I talk about mine for a second? It's the 2020 Jeep Grand Cherokee that I picked up at St. Albert Dodge. Uh, that's a brand new dealership. They've just built this thing out. It's gorgeous. You go, really, Ryan? A car dealership is gorgeous? It is. Go see it. See what I'm talking about. Unbelievable selection, too, of Jeeps. Best in Alberta at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Tis the season to get yourself behind the wheel of a 4x4 that gives you the confidence that a Jeep does. So go see Scott and his team. Again, Sherwood Dodge, St. Albert Dodge, Alberta's best Jeep dealers. You know, when you're talking about the best in Alberta as well, you got to talk about Friesen Brothers, 14 locations across the province, set to open their 15th just off the Hende Rabbit Hill Road in South Edmonton. That's coming up early spring. Friesen Brothers, a legendary presence in Alberta for the decades that they've been here, more than 60 years, you know. And a big part of that is the Red Seal chefs that they employ. They're whipping up Christmas feasts for everybody in Alberta that wants to leave the work behind. Why not put that in front of the talented team at Friesen Brothers? Alberta grown, Alberta owned. Sam, let's take a look at the news. Well, as Ontario heads into lockdown, a uh, 28-day lockdown uh, expected to be announced by Premier Doug Ford today for all parts of the province south of Sudbury. It's going to look a lot like Ontario's prior lockdown in the spring with only essential businesses remaining open. This uh, comes against a backdrop that takes a look at, at Canada's most populated province. They say Ontario is expecting 300 patients in ICU by the end of December, 300 patients with COVID-19. They say at the current rate of transmission of that novel coronavirus, that figure could grow to about 700 ICU patients by the end of January. Bit of a perspective check. Meantime, in the United Kingdom, experts are keeping a keen eye on what's being described as a much more contagious variant of COVID-19. Now, it's unclear, say the experts, and this is important, unclear uh, whether or not the illness is uh, more severe than what we're used to or what it does to vaccine efficacy. Authorities in the UK are investigating. Uh, meantime, restrictions on flights from the UK into Canada are going to be in place for about a 72-hour time period as, as officials continue to monitor those trends. There will be screening at airports, passenger quarantines. Uh, keep in mind, passengers have been arriving from the UK into Canada, hundreds of them, for the past numbers of days into Montreal, Vancouver, uh, Toronto, direct flights. If that includes you or somebody that you know, a reminder, all travelers must isolate for 14 days. This from the Prime Minister in conversation with Rosemary Barton of the CBC over the weekend. Uh, Justin Trudeau indicating, uh, and it seemed almost accidentally, that maybe there could be an election this year. Here's the clip that we're talking as, about. As Bill said, uh, he was already looking towards new challenges ahead of next year's election, poten the potential election next year. I'm 
<laughs> so there he is talking about Bill Morneau, Canada's former finance minister, uh, looking at uh, something different ahead of the next year's election, Brr, the potential election. So you got to wonder. And we're going to talk hockey with our next guest in just a second, but the NHL announcing a shortened season, 56 games. It'll get going January 13th, as we discussed with Gino, that beauty, Gene Principe of Sportsnet a while back. The Edmonton Oilers, the Calgary Flames, Vancouver Canucks will all be playing in the North Division, along with the other Canadian teams, seven of them, in an all-Canadian grouping. The Oilers will play two teams ten times. <laughs> Boy, those are going to be dust ups worth watching. I can't wait. Battle this of Alberta. This is going to be so the much Battle fun. of Alberta ten times. It's just like the oh, okay. First of all, North, let's call it, let's call it the Canadian Division. That's what it is. It's not the North Division. I know the NHL is calling it the North Division. It's the Canadian Division. Let me call it the Great White North Division. Oh, I that, like that. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> I interrupted you. You were. Oh no. Say- the other thing I was just going to say is like, I'm you know I, I'm one of those people that that like. I'm excited to see more Jets games and more Habs games and more Leafs games too. Like it's just it's gonna be so much fun this year. Yeah. I'm actually So it's like it's different. It's not what we get in a normal season. Let's embrace it. I'm 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 gonna be the guy watching the Toronto Maple Leafs for uh I'm gonna be watching the Toronto Maple Leafs for Joe Thornton. Joe Thornton is gonna try to win a cup. I mean, sadly he will not. Uh, we all know that. because no, he plays for the Leafs. Because he plays for the Leafs. Yeah. But still, Jumbo Joe is one of the class acts in the National Hockey League. I love that guy. So anyway, so there you have it. Um, top four in the in the great, we'll call it the great, we're going to call it that. In the great white North division, the top four will make playoffs. The two playoff, uh, first two playoff rounds will stay in that Canadian division. Um, down in Calgary. So a lot of stuff to talk about. H- have you seen this? Uh, Sam, you want to just roll the video? We don't need to hear it so much. I'll just talk over it. But 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 a young man, uh, t- 21 years of age, reported to be 21 years of age. I haven't seen his driver's license by the name of Ocean Weisblatt. Uh, and if you Google him, if you're if you're a hockey DB uh, type of person, you'll find he and his brothers are, are accomplished hockey players. I saw a lot of people saying, why didn't this guy just skate away from the cops? He must not be able to skate. Oh, he can skate. He can play hockey. Uh, and he and his friends can also cause quite a stir this over the weekend uh, as Calgary police officers uh, ultimately uh, arresting this young guy for refusing to a- cooperate with them, refusing to provide his name, refusing uh, to get off the ice. Um, the Calgary police have, have issued a statement on this, and we're going to get into this with our next guest. But this is a video that uh, I'd be surprised if you hadn't seen it or at least heard about it over the weekend. Um this was uh, a moment you can see there, sort of the, the Charlie horse from one police officer. They're trying to take him down. He's refusing to go down. Uh, the one uh, police officer uh, you know, drops a few F-bombs, basically threatens to tase him. Um, you know, we've seen this type of behavior before. Let me let me just say it very like sort of plainly and clearly. If this wasn't a white kid on skates, if this was, I'm just going to say it so- somewhat crudely and just get to the point, if this was a black guy doing this, uh, if, if, if a guy did this, if, if an indigenous man or, or a person of color did this uh, to a police officer, you see they have the taser there pointed at him. Um, if they did this, you know, downtown, for example, or, uh, or during like a Black Lives Matter rally or uh, during a, an Idle No More, I think, I think we know probably how this would go. I don't think that, uh, you know, so you can see here, the guy's really, I mean, I'm a, I don't know about you, Sam. I'm, first of all, I'm blown away they didn't tase him. I am blown away that when the taser was out that they didn't tase him. Um, this it, it goes on and on and on and on and on. And here's the thing. So now uh, <laughs> I, 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 I sort of steer clear of drawing attention to these slime balls. But the, the people at Rebel Media, uh, you know, ha, have now sort of taken up the cause of Ocean Weisblatt, a, a, unless the whole thing was kicked off by them, which I wouldn't put it past them. And they're now like, you know, they're going to be fundraising and they're going to be like defending or sue the Calgary police. And they're turning this into an issue of freedom. Um, from what I've seen online, there's not a lot of people that have a lot of patience for what they saw there. And if you're tuned in right now, I'd love to see what you have to say about this. I want to ask our next guest about this right out of the gate. She's not here to talk about this. Uh, this isn't why we reached out to City of Calgary uh, Councillor Jody Gondek, but uh, I'm sure that she's aware of what's going on here. Councillor, welcome to Real Talk, and thank you for making time for us this morning. I think we might have your mic muted. Uh, Jody, just take a quick look, uh, and we'll make sure Sam can work on that for you. And I'm going to take a quick look here. We'll get that sorted out. 
Test, test, one, two, one, two. We got nothing coming in here. It's okay. While you guys are working on that, Sam, just put me back up full screen. And I'm going to take a look to see what, uh, oh boy, okay. I'm going to take a look here to see what uh, those of you at home are saying about what you're seeing there on the ice. Obviously, it's a situation where we were not there, right? Like, I mean, maybe one or two that are watching or listening right now was there, but we were not there. So we didn't see it all. Uh, Chad Oman points out, I said, Ocean Weisblack is, is an accomplished hockey player. He says he he was an accomplished hockey player. Uh, some people are suggesting that this may be uh, problematic for the future of his hockey career. I don't know what the future of his hockey career looks like. I don't know if he was intending on continuing to play hockey. I'm not sure. Uh, but this is the type of thing where if you Google his name, this is going to be the first 300 things that come up for sure. Uh, Lord of Land says it was a justified arrest. Luke says bingo. Uh, you know, Mark's watching in from Utah. He says, yeah, if, if, if it was a black or indigenous person of color, uh, they would have been taken out with extreme force. Uh, you know, Matthew says he breaks the law. He's told he's under arrest. He refuses to comply. He's a complete idiot. Um, uh, Tracy says, uh, <laughs> yeah, Tracy says, apparently this guy, she says, I don't know how long ago. Apparently he broke the rules at a rec center as well. Um, that from Tracy. What Tracy's referencing is there was, we did see this post on social media. I, I'm going to be careful how I frame this because I don't know if this is true or not. Uh, and it's tough to know if it's true because anybody can go on social media and say anything, right? But there's a gal by the name of Deanna Sample. And Deanna, I can, I can report to you what someone has posted on social media. I'm not necessarily saying it happened because I don't know. But someone on, on Twitter by the name of Deanna Sample claims when she saw that this was Ocean Weisblatt, that was, that was the individual that was arrested, the individual behind this kerfuffle at this Calgary rink, she, she writes, she says, this is the kid? She says, I had the worst teen night of my life as a duty manager a few years ago at the pool because of him. She says, I'm sure you've heard about the night that a kid released fish in the Shaughnessy pool in Calgary, she says that was him. I don't know if it was or not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep saying, I don't know if this is true or not, but a gal by the name of Deanna Sample claims that Ocean Weisblatt, she says the simple version is that he came into our rec facility one night and he continuously broke rule after rule in every part of the building and he got tired of me enforcing our rules, so he went to the pet store across the street and bought guppies and released them all into the pool. So, now... If you trotted out stories of what I did when I was like 15, 16, 17, I mean, I, I did some really dumb shit, like really dumb. You know, I, I, I went through Alberta's young offender uh, program. I stood in front of a judge and explained why I was throwing frozen meat at vehicles on Glenmore Trail in Calgary as an absolutely head up his ass, idiotic 15 year old. And it meant that I was delayed in how long I get my driver's license. And I had to present to groups about vandalism and, and basically being a jackass. And, and I had uh, hours of community service and paid restitution. I deserved all of this. I deserved all of it. And, uh, and, and, uh, and it was on my, on my record, so to speak, until I turned 18. I get it. I mean, if you want to talk about people that have done really dumb, boneheaded, idiotic, ignorant things as kids, uh, I can, I can relate to this and I can be first in line to tell my stories. So releasing guppies in the Shaughnessy pool, if that's true, I don't know how old he was. Sounds like a pretty ignorant thing to do. Uh, some of you think it's probably pretty funny too. I mean, like in a weird, twisted, horrible way, there's a tiny little bit that's that, kind of a little bit funny. Yeah. But it's, I, it's that's, funny. That's, in a that's way where that, my head's at is I'm kind of like, there's like, it's still a little bit funny, it's but a like tiny awful bit, for everybody that works at the pool. It's awful for the fish. First well, of that all, too. they're going right. to die. And they're all, the all going to die. And, you know, but so I can see this from a number of angles. But but again, now people are saying this kid, this kid, he's 21 now. Apparently, I could look him up on, on HockeyDB. And, and so he's so he's the talk of the town in Calgary. And, uh, you know, Beaver says, yeah, if he wasn't white, he'd have been tasered and and batoned already. Uh, Chad says they gave him way too many chances. Sandra says she can't believe they didn't tase him either. Uh, Judy says the whole rink incident guaranteed to be a rebel media setup. It's, it's a fundraiser for them. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know. Neil's watching. Neil says the issue's been so divisive, but it's possible. Neil says, here's this. Uh, we'll put this in front of Counselor Gondek. She's ready to go, ready to rock. Okay, cool. Neil says it, it is possible to think both that the guy is a jerk and deserved it and police could have handled it differently. Uh, maybe. Yeah. I mean, the, the one officer is like dropping F-bombs and like they have their tasers out and everything. And, and But then also keep in mind, like I'm not a police officer, but I will say um, 
You know, uh, Mike Boyd is a former police officer here in Edmonton, and he had this initiative where he was like, officers aren't going to swear anymore. We're going to clean up our language and we're going to do better in the public eye. And I remember a lot of people were like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like every once in a while, you, you, an officer needs that in the toolbox, right? An officer, like if a police officer is always like, hey, just like, sorry if it's an inconvenience, but I'm hoping that you'll be okay if maybe you could come over here and just put your hands behind your back and, you know, I mean, uh-uh, uh-uh. Officers need all the tools in the toolbox, and that includes, in my mind, profanity. I'll fight you all day on that verbally. I'll fight you all day on that. Uh, so, so I don't know. I mean, I don't know how long this guy was annoying them. I don't know how long. I don't think the officers, we didn't see them, ro- you know, rolling up cars sideways into a skid out, guns drawn, get on the ground, get on. That's not what happened here, right? It's a punk, right? It's an ignorant punk that was being an asshole and grandstanding for his friends, right? And, and, and it's, the last and it's of all about being videoed. people. It's all being videoed and, and, uh, I just, to me, anyway, here's what the Calgary police have to say about it. Uh, Video circulating online, 21-year-old man arrested for obstruction of an officer resisting arrest after allegedly trying to avoid a ticket by refusing to identify himself, not remaining with officers when instructed to do so. By law, a person is required to identify themselves if they're being issued a ticket. Otherwise, they can be charged under the criminal code for obstructing an officer. This ensures people cannot avoid law enforcement by simply walking away from police without identifying themselves. People have every right to contest tickets, charges, and laws they think are unjust, but that needs to be exercised in court and not by refusing to obey lawful instructions from officers. It is an offense to physically resist and pull away from officers trying to stop or slow an arrest. This video only shows a portion of what was a long interaction, obviously. Despite signage outlining the rules at the site, bylaw services was called when more than 40 people were using the skating area. They explained the restrictions, the bylaw officers did, but could not get the users to comply. In other words, the people playing hockey ignored the bylaw officers. Due to their noncompliance and the size of the group, police were called to assist. And then goes on and explains, you know, what happened basically. And they said the fact is the situation resulted in an arrest due to the individual trying to avoid law enforcement by obstructing and resisting officers. Uh, Jody Gondek is a counselor down in the city of Calgary. Thanks for making time for us this morning. Sorry about the delay. It's good to have you here. That's okay. Thanks for having me on. Uh, what, do you, what do you make of the whole thing, this whole thing at the rink and the guy that got arrested? And I mean, everybody's talking about it now. Where's your head at with it? I mean, seriously, if the police came and asked me who I was, I would tell them. And if I was doing something wrong, I'd stop doing it. So when you've been asked that many times to get off the ice and you don't do it, what's going to happen is the police are going to, forcibly remove you so we all knew how this was going to play out and it played out the way it does i'm just surprised that outlets like the rebel didn't care so much when this was happening to people of color yeah no it's weird it's it's almost like they care about some things counselor they don't care and it's it's so weird it's it's totally weird um let's get to listen we we only have about uh 12 minutes with you uh we've got the audio sorted out but i want to get right to the point because you posted something yesterday on your twitter that was uh extremely powerful and uh, and and you basically talked about how as as an elected official and as a city councilor you've been uh, keeping a stiff upper lip as uh as they said in world war ii in britain um through this pandemic but but do I say cracks in the armor a little bit yesterday? Were you maybe just showing showing that you're actually human a little bit? What was going on yesterday? Yeah, yesterday was a tough day. Um, I think the weight of everything just hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, it's It's been a tough haul for everybody. There's people that are taking care of loved ones that are ill. They're trying to make sure that their kids are getting through school. People have lost their jobs, you know, and many of our families have experienced um, a variety of those things. So you know, you keep going because you have to. But there was just something about Saturday night and seeing the soldiers of Odin out fully proud of their hatred walking in the streets of my city. And it just, it made me start crumbling. And by the time I woke up yesterday on Sunday, I just, I didn't want to get out of bed. I just didn't want to deal with anything. And that's not like me. Um, And I had to stop and think about, was I really okay? And I wasn't, I needed a break. I needed to walk away from all of this stuff for a couple hours. And I posted what I did to say I'm broken today because I was, it is not okay on any level that groups like that think it's okay to march around a city and make people feel unwelcome. 
I mean, this is my city too. You can't march with that kind of hate. So you took some time um, and, and, and you reflected on it. And, and do you find yourself, do you approach this morning with a new resolve? I mean, to a certain degree, you're in a position, number one, you've, you've got a, a, a real platform and number two, you're a respected Calgarian. People are going to listen to what you have to say. So what does your perspective look like this morning? My perspective this morning is, hey, I'm back. You know, I'm still relatively pissed off at the whole thing. And I think you have to be. This mission of countering racism is not going to be easy. It's going to take a long time. But if we don't start stepping up and speaking up, um, nobody's going to change this but us. This has become institutionalized. And the thing that worries me the most is groups like this feel it's okay to be out in public without any kind of thing revealing their identity. They think it's all right to be this full of hate and everybody can know who they are. I mean, at least the KKK war hoods. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of the big, that's kind of the big thing about this, right? Like if, you know, if you look in, in the United States, like, you know, the, the, you know, I mean, the, the whole sort of like Tiki Torch Army, you're just talking about the Proud Boys and the Three Percenters and the Soldiers of Odin. And, 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 it, and it may not be, you know, full blown neo Nazi skinhead or, like you said, recognizable, like the, you know, the imperial wizards of the KKK walking around like this. One of the things about the, the Soldiers of Odin, I remember I actually had an interview a couple of years ago with the, the, the Edmonton chapter president or whatever he calls himself. Um, it was a battle of wits, counselor, and, and, and he was unarmed. Uh, but, uh, but, but he wanted to insist to me. He insisted the whole time. He says, we're not racist. We're not racist. We're not racist. They're trying to sort of downplay this whole thing. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is, I think one of the strategies for all these groups uh, through the, even the centuries you know, has been to brazenly present themselves to walk in and here we are and to intimidate, right? You know, they'll show up in courthouses. They'll show up at, you know, people's places of work to intimidate. So how do you fight back? What do you do? What do you think would be an appropriate measure in, in Calgary or in Alberta across Canada? I mean, there's three fundamental things here, and I think all of us understand them. Racism, number one, is wrong. It's just stupid. You, you can't hate people for what they look like. Secondly, there is an economic argument to be made for ensuring that you are taking every measure to be an anti-racist city and country. If you look at population growth, if you look at the fact that our natural birth rates are not high in Canada and we need immigration to make sure that our workforce is adequately staffed, then you're gonna to need to be a welcoming place. The economic argument in and of itself should be enough for everybody. But don't forget that in order to attract and retain talent, and make sure that we've got diverse ideas growing our cities, you're gonna to need to show that you're a place that everyone is welcome. And so I guess I'm looking to the business community as well. We've identified that systemic racism is a problem, that institutional racism is a problem, and it's not the people, it's the processes and the systems that we've built over time that are racist in their nature. And it is really uncomfortable for people to have these conversations about racism because they wanna say, I'm not racist. My family's not racist. I wasn't raised racist. You guys are talking about stuff that happened in the past. No, we're not. These people are marching in your streets. Wake up. It's happening. So we need to do something about it collectively. Have you noticed an, a rise in, in these sort of tensions, these demonstrations, these sentiments? I'm sure that, I mean, I, I would have to suspect that as an elected official, a city councilor, You've probably received your fair share of deplorable correspondence to your office. I don't know, but I'm assuming uh, probably some some pretty uh, hate filled personal messages. Are they on the rise in, in your anecdotal experience? I think it's more bold. I think it's more in your face. And I think if this was reversed, remember when radicalization was the only thing that we ever talked about because we were yeah. so worried that everyone was going to be radicalized. This is the same thing. Why are we not treating it the same way? This is a hate group that is out on the steps of City Hall saying, we don't like certain people in the community. And we're, we're just sitting here waiting for somebody to do something. Well, that somebody is us. I think it's going to be important for the Minister of Justice to step up and think about how he's going to address brazen hatred in our province. I think federally, we're going to have to bolster our laws to ensure that hate crimes, whether they're verbal or physical, are addressed in a different way. Like, we need to start doing something about this. The time has passed. 
what sort of a response did you get when you posted? I mean, I, I noticed that your, your tweet was, uh, got a lot of attention and, and you certainly saw a lot of support. Uh, but what did you, you know, I mean, with regards to the public response, when you said I'm broken today, right? You said soldiers of Odin walk the streets of my city filled with hate for people like me while so many silently watch it happen. How would you characterize the public response? Was there a comment or did someone take action in a way that was meaningful to you? Um, I honestly was not expecting people to really care at all. It was a Sunday. Um, I just figured I'd get a, a couple of folks that know me saying, hey, are you okay? And, you know, it's going to be all right. We can do this together. Um, it was bonkers to me how many people replied. I got DMs saying, we're here with you. I'm sorry I haven't been louder. Uh, one of my favorite ones was um, a gentleman that said, I'm a white guy in my 50s. I stand with you. Yeah. Um, it's it's funny how many people just all of a sudden thought, oh, okay, maybe I need to say something. Because I think what we tend to do as a society is look to people in elected positions. And we tend to look to people who have been through um, incidents of racism, and we expect them to lead the charge and fight the fight. Well, we're happy to do that, but we need support. And sometimes it's a person that looks like the people who hate, who has a better influence on them to convince them that this is wrong. So I think it's important to recognize that. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting messages from people saying you're anti-white, you hate white people. I think the white guy I married would argue that I, I really don't hate him. He frustrates me sometimes, yeah. but, you know, who amongst us doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, I, I love what you said. You know, I was never out of the fight. I just needed time to heal. And I, I just think that those, those are words of power. And, uh, and, and I'm glad that you're feeling healed up in a, in, a, in a remarkable turnaround time. Let me ask you a couple questions just in, in your role as a city councilor. We're, we're obviously uh, experiencing a holiday season. The month of December into January is going to be a little bit different than most people will have ever remembered. Um, how are you holding up personally? How is the city of Calgary holding up? And, and what's something that's on your radar uh, with regards to maybe an, a, a top priority item in the context of COVID response as an elected city official down in Calgary? Well, I think most Calgarians have come to the realization a very long time ago, months ago, before the provincial government did, that times are different and gatherings are something that's causing um, a lot of transmission. And so people took it very seriously. I know people that have not gone to a grocery store in nine months. Yeah. Um, everybody adapted and people started um, doing Zoom calls like this with their family. Um, even through the tough times, people realized it was important to stay home and keep the numbers down. And I think with Christmas around the corner, there's a lot of people that have adapted what they're going to do. I've heard a lot of families say, you know what, when we're out of this, I'm going to have a real Christmas and I'm going to get together with everybody and people saying, I'm not going to take my family for granted anymore. I'm going to see my friends more often when I can. So I think it's important to recognize that a lot of people really are doing the right thing. And in terms of what's around the corner, the fact that we have a vaccine is a very big deal. Um, the fact that rapid testing is being expanded to other places is a big deal. What I'm really hoping to see are more measures in places where people in marginalized communities are in work situations where they're exposed to COVID-19 in a way that others aren't. And that transmission risk is then brought to their home, often a multi-generational home. We've got to start looking at those workplaces the other thing I really hope we get our head around is that paramedics are key to our healthcare system. And I really hope they are able to get their vaccines a lot sooner than the rest of us. Counselor, what's going on with the, the, the green line is a hugely important uh, piece of, oh, here you go, the, the look on your face. Yeah. <laughs> I, I save it to the end, but just in case your head explodes, uh, we still got a good interview in here. But uh, I, I know that this is something that you are working hard on. Obviously, you're very involved in this project, and there's this procurement pause um, I'm perceiving this as a lay person to be a, a hesitance on the part of the province uh, to fund this. Uh, I know that Calgary's eager to get it built. Is, is that accurate? What's going on with the Green Line? Um, so we just had a Green Line meeting on Friday to figure out what was going on. We have a letter now from the province that provides a little bit of clarity on what their concerns are. I think everyone has gotten to the point of realizing that this cannot be about personalities. This cannot be about the politics. The fact is we need a green line because the public transit system in Calgary is missing its spine. It's 
the north-south connector that we desperately need. And if we are going to grow into a city that's trying to cut down on emissions and is trying to help people who need to take public transit get from the places where they live to the places where they work and go to school, this project has to go forward. If you look at a map of rapid transit in our city, there's a gaping hole in north central Calgary. We need this project. And, you know, I'm not one to run from a fight. Um, I'm fairly scrappy. I have things to say and I say them. But in this particular case, I think we need to tone down the rhetoric. We need to put aside our differences politically. We need to focus on the fact that this is a public transit project that's needed. How do we get to a common understanding of how we get there? That's what I'm looking for. All right. And will you, uh, in closing, Councillor, will you wait until incumbent Mayor Nehed Nenshi announces his intention uh, with regards to next fall's election before you announce that you too will run for the mayor of Calgary. Oh my goodness. This is like the greatest rumor I've heard. Um, you know, if I decide to run for mayor, it'll be because I think I'm the right person at the right time for that job. Yeah. It won't be because of who's in the field. So, you know, stay tuned. I might do it. I might not. I got lots of stuff on my mind right now. So I got to find the right vehicle to deliver what I have to offer. I think you'd win. I, I like your chances. It'd be, I mean, if, if Nancy doesn't run, you've got yourself and, and, and Jeremy Farkas, right? Your colleague on Calgary City Council. I've seen a couple others have thrown their name in the mix, and, and, and I don't know how strong their name recognition is. Um, you know, it's been 20 years since I've lived in Calgary, but, but I, I like your chances. I, I, think that, I, think, I think you'd have a hell of a campaign, uh, and I think you'd see a lot yeah. of support. I'll look forward to seeing it. And if you want, when you're ready to make your announcement, you let us know. We'd love for you to do it right here. Oh, I will. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, Councillor. It's great to see you again. Good to see you, too. There you go. Uh, City Councillor Jody Gondek out of uh, Calgary. Uh, I just love, she, she just wore her heart on her sleeve uh, over the weekend, just basically talking about the impact that, that seeing this hatred on display, these soldiers of Odin uh, walking the streets of Calgary, the impact it had on her. And, and, and also, um, you know, on social media, things can go so sideways and get so nasty and so ugly. It was great to see so many people being like, we got gotcha. you. We got you and seeing the same thing right now on our uh, YouTube comments, our live comments. Uh, Mr. Cynic wonders, has Calgary ever had a female mayor? Um, off the top of my head, the answer is no, uh, unless I mean, but my knowledge only goes back to, you know, I grew up there. I was born at the Holy Cross Hospital there in 1977. Uh, no, Calgary's never had a female mayor. Edmonton's had Jan Reimer, of course. Uh, Red Deer currently has Tara Veer, of course. Uh, Melissa Blake, up, right, up in Fort McMurray, not, like pre, not, not currently. Um, yeah, no. So, so there you have it. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, Chris is watching, and he says, you know, UCP donors have been fighting the green line all the way. They're going to try to kill the project, uh, you know. Th that green line have you been following that sam at all it's like it's it's a hugely i mean it seems like all i don't know if public transit conversations are more contentious in alberta than they are in other parts of canada it sort of seems like yeah i think they're more contentious in alberta in general i don't um, think you have a lot of people not as many people that are i mean you, you have the people that really see value in public transit like me yeah Great. I, I am a transit evangelist. Planted, we will talk about this. Oh yeah, I'm gonna plant that. You've flag planted right your now. flag, and and I bet our next guest is gonna. We'll, we'll throw this to Stephen Carter too. We'll go hot potato right out of the gates. Um, but uh, I uh, yeah, and then and then there are people that just think that that it's the biggest waste of money. That the public transit is you just we we should have more roads, more roads. <laughs> so what's your biggest argument for investing billion and a half dollars in transit? Uh, it pays dividends. Um, it pays dividends in lower emissions. It pays dividends in less congestion. It pays dividends in providing a network that people can move freely around. Like, you know, even if you think about just sort of the notion of car culture, like think about if you get in your car, regular size car, and you're one person and you're driving, how much space do you just take up in the world? Now think about you sitting on an LRT or on a bus or even on a bicycle. It's just... The, you know, in, in growing municipalities like Edmonton and Calgary are, I think that we've been very fortunate to have a lot of space for a very mm -hmm. long time. We're used to it. We're used to it. We're very comfortable with our cars. But if we want to become a dense urban center, we have to embrace a transit backbone. Yeah. It's like this city will not grow properly if we don't have 
a proper transit infrastructure underneath all of it. And, you know, Edmonton's bus network redesign is addressing that. It, you know, our current transit system is designed for a city of 400,000 people. Now we're about to have ones designed for 2 million people. Oh, man, you talk about the bus network redesign in Edmonton. You're, people are, you're, you, you just... You just lit a cigarette right next to a powder keg, my man. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's awesome to see Michelle Narang watching in this morning. She says, Counselor Gondek, you are an asset and a brilliant leader. Stay strong and loud. Uh, if I remember correctly, Michelle is a counselor, I think, in Rocky Mountain House. Uh, good morning, Rocky. Good morning to the West Country, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, we've got headlines coming up at 10 o'clock. Right now, I just wanted to remind you that there are uh, partners uh, we call them our Real Talk Builders that ensure that each and every day we can keep bringing you this program with real talk on the issues that matter most to you. And that includes the amazing team at Local Waste. A heads up, you know, Local Waste sponsors Trash Talk every Friday around 10 o'clock. I think this week's it was at 1020 because our roundtable went overtime, and we don't apologize for that. That roundtable was incredible. Uh, this week, seeing as Friday is Christmas Day, and we're excited that uh, you know we're all going to have an opportunity to relax. Um, you know, I'm probably going to be six Baileys in by 8:30 a.m. Mountain Time. We will not be broadcasting a show Friday morning. It means trash talk is going to be coming at you at 10 o'clock on Thursday. If you have a gripe to get off your chest. You got something you want to rant or rave about, you can send it to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Local Waste has been in the game for more than 25 years, an independent organization owned and run by local families that are taking on those big, faceless, multinational garbage corporations. They've done it. Their secret to success building real relationships in the communities they serve, and they want your business. So give Chris or Lauren a call today at 780-242-9746 or check out localwaste.com. CA. We're also very excited about Dairy Queens in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. That includes Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road. I suggested to you on Friday that because these stores owned by Mark and Michael, good friends of Real Talk, good friends of the show, because they're extending the offer of 50% off Christmas frozen ice cream logs for Real Talk audience members. You go to one of those six locations, you pick up one of these frozen ice cream logs, just delightful they are, and you say, you say, hey, Real Talk, and they're going to give you 50% off at the till. So Dawn's watching in on the weekend, and, and I suggested, you know, if the weather holds up, you just go ahead and you drop these off on your neighbor's doorsteps, right? You can just drop off an ice cream treat from Dairy Queen on your neighbor's doorstep. Don did exactly that. He tweeted photographic evidence to us, and so Don I today loved that. isn't that great? Yeah, we we applaud you, Don, and uh, keep Dairy Queen in mind. These six locations that support Real Talk as you're making your food delivery or drive-through plans over these next number of days. All right, let's get to our next guest. He's a political strategist. He has run uh, winning campaigns. I mean, isn't this interesting? Let me just say, isn't this interesting? We kick off the show today. Didn't plan it this way. Stephen Carter, good morning to you, my man. We didn't plan it this way, but we had uh, Don Iveson's uh, miracle campaign manager on the show, Out of the Gates, with Chris Henderson. And look at this. When Nahed Nenshi captured the attention of the world, uh, what was it, back, I think, in 2010, uh, came from, I, I, with respect, I'll say, almost out of nowhere, and became the mayor that everybody on the planet had heard of. It was under the direction of then campaign manager Stephen Carter, who joins us now on Real Talk. Good morning, pal. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing all right. I don't know if you saw the Henderson interview, but we we kind of got into an interesting. I mean, obviously, uh, Mayor Nenshi hasn't, uh, unless he's done it this morning, hasn't announced his intention with regards to next fall's election. We talked about how it gets harder and harder and harder for an incumbent to win the longer the duration of their term. Do you agree? Yeah, I do. I think that, it, that you accumulate baggage as you as you move along, right? There, there's decisions that uh, you don't like and you will remember uh, over the course of the term where, you know, that and that's just the nature of the game. The, the more power, the more decisions you have to make uh, that are uh, negative for small groups of people. And they remember those negative decisions way more than they remember the positive decisions. Uh, and that's just the reality of, of politics. I, I have so much that I want to talk to you about in, in these next 20 minutes or so. Uh, Stephen, last night, I was uh, as I was out walking the dog, I was catching up on the latest episode of the Strategist podcast with, uh, of course, you guys have done an amazing job for a long time with that. Uh, and um, uh, Corey Hogan, who's on the show before, and Zane Valji as well. The three of you have been, you've been in the podcast game for a long time, man, haven't you? I mean, kind of since they were a thing. 
Oh yeah, it was, it, we we well, I mean, we're the the biggest arrogant trio in the history of mankind. <laughs> uh, so that enabled us to uh, start our own podcast the same way that you have here. I mean, let's talk about what we really share, Ryan, and that is a healthy sense of ourselves. Yes, uh, that's what you and I have in common, and uh, it's enabled us to produce podcasts. Our podcast, the Strategists. You know, we just released the Holiday Spectacular as we do every year. Uh, it is epic. Uh, I, I was, you know, we tried to get you on, but uh, people felt like uh, Christmas Carol karaoke was a little bit derivative, uh, and we had nothing else to talk to you about. Yeah, so I'm well, really pleased that you were able to bring me on the show. That's yeah, really well, nice. Thank- well, the good news is, is that surprise, uh, it's time for Christmas Carol karaoke here on this Monday morning. <laughs> And uh, no, you you got to a lot of ground. On, 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 on the, okay, that's okay. Sam, Sam, is, Sam is feeling very emboldened this morning. Um, Sam, can you can you roll up the B roll of Ocean Y Splat for me, Carter? What's your t- you? I don't know. Are you are you? Hang on, Sam. You you are you in Canmore right now? Are you in Calgary? Where are you at right now? I'm in Calgary. I'm in Calgary. Yeah. Okay, you're in Calgary. So this is your home yeah. city where everybody's talking about the Calgary police uh, affecting an, an arrest, as they say. Uh, what what do you make of this story? What do you make of this this guy's actions, police actions too? Well, I think I think that let's start off with this guy is totally wrong. Okay. And, but we can hold that this guy is totally wrong and we can hold that the police did this ineffectively uh, both at the same time. Uh, both of these things can be true. And the, the first reason I think the police did this ineffectively is they put themselves in danger. Um, and you can see this I and mean, it's about to happen here as we're watching it. They're going to try in their shoes to take down a guy on his skates. Yeah. Uh, and that's just not a good idea. It's uh, they're going to be slipping. Here they go. They're slipping. They're sliding. You know, he's being an asshole. OK, great. He's being an absolute asshole. But these two are now putting themselves in a dangerous position. And that's that's my primary beginning part. Uh, the second is they didn't disperse the audience. Right. This guy's being a prick because he's on video. That's why he's being a prick. Um, you get rid of the video, you get rid of the audio audience. And this guy, you know, what's he going to do? Skate around for four hours? You know, get him off the ice, uh, but you don't have to do it on video. You don't have to do it with his buddy sitting there in, in full hockey gear. Um, they put themselves in a dangerous position, uh, which does not excuse his actions. But this goes badly in about 15 different ways. If, if you know, if one of them feels like he's reaching for their gun, if, uh, you know, if, you know, he assaulted a police officer. We've heard these lines before. And when it's done and it's a, 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 a racially charged situation, Uh, We all come down on the other side, but this guy's being a prick, doesn't excuse his actions, but these officers are putting themselves in incredible danger, uh, and I just think that there was a whole bunch of different ways uh, to make this. They had, you know, and the excuses are, he got what he deserved. What the hell does that mean? Police don't met out punishment. Police don't determine whether or not a person deserves, um, you know, uh, uh, to be taken down or arrested police officers enforce the law and then the justice system dispenses justice there is no deserve in this category um they put themselves into in, into a very dangerous situation um and i just think that it was totally needless uh you know what what else did they have to do with their time they can wait this out they can wait for him to uh to get tired of skating around just sit by his, his shoes his shoes are right, right over there on the dock just wait for him to come get his shoes and then put the freaking cuffs on the asshole. Well, a listener said uh, nothing will get a 21-year-old to move quicker than seeing the tow truck show up to impound his car. Uh, that's one. I'm just blown away. Like, here, So you know what this reminds me of? Like Totally different circumstances, obviously, but Chief Allen Adam. Uh, indigenous chief outside the Fort McMurray casino that basically got clotheslined by an RCMP officer taken down and beaten. He posted photos of his face swollen out to here uh, because he took issue with uh, basically how he was being treated and he felt like he was being profiled. And he has gone on to say that that profiling and, and this is an, this is a chief. Uh, in an indigenous community. So imagine your average person that doesn't have that recognition, what it's like to walk a mile in their shoes. But he said this was the culmination of a long sort of a period of time. Uh, That's why he was frustrated with police. He was uncooperative and he paid a physical price for it. And I guarantee you, Carter, that the people that many of the people that are saying Chief Allen Adams should have put his hands behind his back and complied with police orders are probably the same people that are celebrating Ocean Weisblatt's defiance of police. I would I would go so far as to guarantee it. Oh yeah, this is this. If, if we pretend like this isn't some sort of racially charged outcome, 
mean, this is ridiculous. One of the reasons why people were so excited about this is it was a white guy finally getting his ass kicked by police. Um, okay, that's fine. I mean, I just don't think that the police should be putting themselves in a position where they're kicking people's asses. I think that they should be uh, safer than that. We've stopped, for example, car chases. You know, back in the day, the, you know, if you sped away from a police officer in your car, there'd be like seven cars tailing you with their sirens wailing, and they would, you know, do these maneuvers to take out your car, and we stopped that. We stopped that because it, it tended towards creating situations that were, were, were negative. Um, we've trained the police differently uh, to put themselves in a position where they don't have to put themselves at risk. They shouldn't have to chase after, you know, uh, offenders. This guy was a dick. His, his primary offense was being a dick and not following health orders. Um, you know, you know he, he deserves to be handcuffed. He deserves to go to jail. He deserves to have what is thrown to him. But these officers didn't need to put themselves at risk. And, and that's where I keep coming down on this. And, and, and the people who are opposing my point of view, first of all, don't seem to have the ability to separate the fact that this guy can be, can be an asshole and so can the police. You know, there are two actors in this. Uh, both of their both of their actions have real and legitimate long-term consequences, and I think that we need to be uh, grown up enough to have that conversation. Thank God I'm on your show today because we actually have enough time to discuss it. The wide world of Twitter um, doesn't seem to be able to gather up the nuance and uh, and separate he was an asshole uh, from he. You know we don't we don't do physical confrontations when the police are uh, on ice and unable to affect the proper takedown let's be honest they were unable to affect the proper takedown that was ridiculous it, I, it, it was it was ridiculous and here's the thing is like i if I, this is just a human emotion so if i'm a police officer and if i can just say it and and let me just acknowledge so there's two white dudes having this conversation two privileged white dudes having this conversation so let me just put that out there so i don't know what it's like number one to be a police officer i don't know what it's like uh to be a female police officer but i have read a lot of the comments and a lot of the comments are like you know pretty disparaging toward that uh female police officer that that protects and serves and puts herself in 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 harm's way every single day um she was the one that was you know dropping f-bombs she was the one that you know basically was not the one that had her taser out but she was the one that was talking about tasing him and they're saying oh yeah that's because she can't you know she can't take him down so she has to use it you know this that and the other there's this kind of talk and then I imagine the frustration of an officer that maybe this is like their eighth call of the day where someone was a real mm -hmm. jerk to them, right? Or maybe they had a bad night the night before, or maybe things aren't going well at home, or maybe whatever, and then they're being embarrassed, right? So then now this guy's grandstanding, his friends are snickering, he's sneering, it's obvious that it's being videoed, he's making them look silly because like you said, they don't have blades on, they have their shoes, they're slipping around. That to me, and I know this is not how they train police officers, but I'm just saying, if I'm a cop that's frustrated, that does not like the way that I'm being portrayed, that's being embarrassed, and that is unable to take this guy, I mean, that is when I'm going to use force. That is when I'm going to pull out my taser. I'm actually blown away they didn't tase the guy. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they put themselves in a situation where escalation was required. Um, the fact that they, you know, he did not comply. He did, he put himself in a position where he could have been tased. Uh, and these officers allowed, were, were willing participants. Uh, and that, that's the problem with this. I mean, you're absolutely right. This is probably the eighth call they've had that day. They're tired. They're, they were probably pre treated pretty poorly for breaking up a hockey game, you know, but there's 40 people on those ice. This, these people were wrong. Okay. The, clearly these people did the wrong thing. Uh, and these officers we're put in a very negative position to try and enforce that law. Um, but, you know, they're trained professionals. They're the ones who are, are given the training about de-escalating a situation. People said, well, what would you have them do? Well, I'd have them ticket everybody else. Ticket everybody else in the game. Um, put And get rid of them. Have, make them go home. Yeah. That's the first thing you do. Get everybody else in the rink to get their skates off, to get the hell out of, out of Dodge. You had a lot of work to do because you had to write all those tickets for all of those people. Get started on all that work and then just let this other guy skate around. Uh, Stephen Carter joining us. Um, everything cool right now? <laughs> I don't know. Everything's going sideways. So we'll get that figured out in just a second. Uh, uh, everything went sideways because we lost Stephen. Oh, did we? Okay. We did. Yeah. Well, let's so work, we'll, let's uh, we'll work, work on getting him back. back. Okay, yep. thanks, Sam. Uh, Wayne says, I agree with charging the guy, uh, but police have to administer action equally, uh, like at an anti-mask uh, protest. 
Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, when, you, when you talk about administering action equally, uh, each situation calls for its own response. Um, I've seen a lot of interesting assertions. People will be talking about like, um, you know, oh, police are coming to shut down, you know, the outdoor rink or pe- police are coming to shut down a, a backyard campfire with some friends. We got Carter back, so we'll bring him back in here. Um, you know, then then how come, you know, police officers are going to shut down my backyard barbecue with my friends, but they're not going to shut down the Black Lives Matter rally. What's up with that? Huh? And a lot of people are finding ways to have these. Carter, just to bring you up to speed, I'm talking about some of the the divisive rhetoric that we see. You know, people will say, and I mean, we're even seeing it from from elected MLAs at the provincial level. Quite frankly, um, uh, there's a bit of a double standard here because you know we've got this uh, this backyard things being shut down here. People are being ticketed for having campfires, but at the same time, people are out here protesting income inequality or police brutality, and they're not being arrested. So what gives? I mean, first of all, the people who aren't protesting income inequality or Black Lives Matter now, they were protesting that at a different time with different reasons. Um, and I think that they could have been ticketed. Uh, if, if the rules of today were in place, they could have been ticketed, but they're not behaving like that. What we're seeing now is the anti-mask protesters out there behaving like morons and not getting ticketed. Um, they're starting to get ticketed now. We're starting to see better enforcement. Uh, but this all stems from the way that the, the process was implemented. And this implementation from Jason Kenney was slipshod and half-hearted from the beginning. He relied on individual responsibility. That's what's gotten us into this position because it turns out many of us can't be individually responsible uh, as evidenced by this Yahoo on the, on the, on the ice or as you know, John Carpe organizing these anti-mask protests here in Calgary. These people are morons. Uh, they need rules or they can't follow them. And even when they have rules, they wish to rebel. Uh, yeah, it turns out your, your backyard uh, barbecue may be broken up if you have 40 people at it. Um, that's the way it should be. Uh, so you know, we have laws for reasons. Uh, it turns out when I go 132 kilometers an hour on 100 kilometer an hour road, I get a $300 ticket. I may be speaking from personal experience. That happens. That's the way it's supposed to work. You're supposed to have consequences for your actions. You're supposed to follow the law that's put in place for collective responsibility. Uh, I have no problem with it. I didn't complain when I got my hundred thirty or three hundred dollar ticket. Um, well, I did a little bit to my wife. <laughs> what did you get a three hundred dollar ticket for? Maybe speeding. I might have oh, been. Oh, I mean, no one's gonna. No law. one's gonna feel sorry for you. Do you? I have I it. Broke the law. I have a ticket a coming ticket. up. Uh, it's due now this minute that I'm not fighting this ticket. Um, yeah. went up to Slave Lake this summer, uh, to, to MC, uh, Gord Bamford show. And, uh, and it was a wonderful celebration. Everyone's in their cars because of COVID, obviously it was a drive-in yeah. show and it was so much fun. And the organizers there in Big Lakes County did an amazing job. And I was lucky enough to be driving at that time. I was partnered with Mercedes Benz Edmonton West and they had me in the, the CL 43, the AMG Cabriolet, like the convertible, like sexy like unbelievable and so so i'm showing up to this first of all i didn't totally think it through because i have a big lifted up 92 jeep with big tires on it and and it's super loud and and um i should have drove that like in retrospect pulling into the like what do you think everybody in slave lake drove to the uh to the drive-in concert not mercedes-benz convertibles um no (laughs) no um (laughs) I might, I should have just shown up with like a bow tie and John Fluvog shoes because they were, everyone was, you know, but I did have cowboy boots on. And, um, and so, so, and I, and I was also thinking I wanted, cause, cause it was a sponsored vehicle. So I wanted it to look good. Right. So on my yeah. way in, so on my way into slave, I stop at the, at the wand wash. I stopped at the car wash and I washed it. I arm rolled the tires. I mean, this thing is looking unreal. And so I get out of the car wash and how do you know, I didn't have a sham. I didn't have a chamois. So the only other way to dry the car is to just pin it and just let it, you know, it'll dry itself. And, um, of course I didn't realize. And if you've been to slave Lake before, you know, exactly that, you know, the exact car wash I'm talking about. It's right on the edge of town, right on your way. in. so I didn't realize that the speed limit had changed from highway speed to residential speed. Um, and so, (laughs) yeah, yeah. So I got clocked going uh well i got clocked going mid 90s in a 50 and but the photo is a great photo the car looks unbelievable in the photo that, <laughs> but you know that's a that's a, it's more than 500 dollars. that ticket's more than 500 dollars. but i'm actually very lucky that it was photo radar and i wasn't pulled over because i have a feeling that car would have been i would have been going home without the car i think i think i would have been pretty yeah. close 
Yeah, the, the escalation in fines is quite a fun thing. Uh, yeah. We can talk about police enforcement of fines on, on another <laughs> real talk with Ryan Jesperson. No, I'm not, I'm not here to get anybody to feel sorry for me because nobody's going to feel sorry for me. Um, Carter, I want to ask you about a million things. You take this on, you, Corey, and Zane do in your in your holiday edition of The Strategist. Uh, the, the federal carbon tax is going up to $170 a ton. Uh, I think, it, obviously not right away, uh, over time, but oh, we, we talked yeah. to uh, federal Federal Environment Minister Jonathan Wilkinson late last week about it. Uh, in particular, what we're hearing from our audience members, uh, most especially working in agriculture, saying we're just getting killed by this thing. Uh, and 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 I read a, a pretty lengthy and 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 pretty astute letter from a farmer uh, who, who wrote in and basically spelled it out. He said he's an accountant first of all. Uh, no, was he was he an engineer? He was an engineer, Sam, right? He was an engineer, an engineer and a farmer. And so he approached it and he said, like, here's basically what it's going to cost for us. He did it up against. I mean, like it was a great letter. And uh, and I said to the minister, what say you? And and he and his response to that. I appreciated Minister Wilkinson's candor through the interview. But in that specific context, he basically said uh, the government is willing to continue to listen. And all of the ag producers that were watching the show were like, that's not an answer. Uh, what do you make of Ottawa's plan? They're ramping it up pretty aggressively. Obviously believe that they have a mandate to do so. They they must have polling that suggests they're not going to lose the next election by doing it. Take us into where your head's at on it. Oh, this wins the election for them. I mean, obviously yeah. in us, us in Alberta, we have this little kind of, uh, you know, the Albertan reaction, right? The carbon tax is bad. Um, th there is a much larger group of people who are environmentalists in the rest of the country uh, than there are people who are pro-oil and gas. Uh, people see themselves not buying, their next car isn't an uh, internal combustion engine. Their next car is going to be powered by electricity. That's what people feel. That's what people are moving towards. And if you look at the numbers yesterday, the way that they're uh, moving towards electronic vehicles is amazing. Um, and I think that that will be Canada in very short period of time. Keep in mind, this $170 doesn't take place until 2030. I mean, we're we're slowly implementing this over the next decade. Uh, so by the time we get there, I'm not sure if if the the farmers that are complaining about this now are are still ne necessarily using the equipment that they're using today. Um, yeah, I mean, if it disadvantages farms, uh, that's a real problem because we have a a food quality and food provision issue that would need to be taken care of. There's a real easy solution to this, and that's just to sh simply shift. Uh, the way that the rebates are working. Keep in mind that uh, everybody wanted a revenue neutral carbon tax. This is a revenue neutral carbon tax. This is redistributing the money that is collected to Canadians. It is the thing that we asked for uh, when we wanted a carbon or when we were discussing a carbon tax in the, before. Remember, we weren't against the carbon tax. We were against the idea of a tax grab. Yeah. Uh, this isn't a tax grab. It's being redistributed. So if it means that I don't get $3,000 in my family every year, uh, and instead, I get uh, twenty five hundred dollars of rebate. I'm for that. I'm for that. They could just readjust the rebate and give a much higher uh, rebate to farmers that are paying a much higher rate. Um, but you know, there's there's all kinds of ways of solving this problem, uh, and we will solve the problem. But we're going to be paying a carbon tax. Uh, we're going to have a market based solution to the climate. Uh, that is reality. Uh, and whether that is a cap and trade system or a carbon tax system. Um, we're going to have it. Uh, it, it. The only people denying that are Scott Moe and Jason Kenney. Uh, and I just think that they're on the losing side of that issue, even if they can win in their respective provinces. Well, but Carter, so yeah, because I think that it's important to point out that small C conservatives, I mean, like carbon pricing has not been antithetical to conservative ideology in past. As a matter of fact, many prominent conservatives have supported the idea of pricing carbon. Oh yeah, this is this is Preston Manning's idea. I mean, this is this is the idea that everybody wanted. Let's let, let us not forget that the people who first brought in a carbon tax was the government of Alberta. We just brought it in on large large scale emitters. That was the very first carbon tax in in the in Canada. Um, so the good the good people of Alberta brought it in first, and now it's going nationwide. And of course, uh, we don't like that when it's actually applied to us as individual consumers, but when it's applied to the the wholesalers or the production people. That's fine with us. It's, so it, it's funny because if we don't see it, we don't seem to care. That's one of the reasons that we didn't like the GST. Um, the manufacturer's tax was fine with us because we didn't see it. Uh, ignorance is not a, a taxation strategy. 
Uh, we need to see the taxes applied to us so we, we can actually make behavioral change. I want to, I was going to say that would be an, that would be an incredible trivia question, which Alberta under, under which Alberta premier uh, did the province first roll out a carbon tax? It wasn't under you guys. I, I, for people that don't know, you were chief of staff to former premier Allison Redford. That was before then, correct? Yeah, it was Stelmac. Stelmac. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, the conservatives brought it in. It's the right decision. If you want to pr- reduce the amount of carbon, it's very simple. You just charge for it. Um, and that's how you do it. And people will change their behavior. Yeah. Uh, by the way, speaking of trivia, I blew it uh, earlier when a, a listener, I think it was Mr. Cynic, wrote in and said, has Calgary ever had a female mayor? And I said, off the top of my head, no. Uh, and then I started sort of like off the top of my head going, okay, so you got like Tara Veer and Red Deer. You had Melissa Blake and Fort McMurray. And I forgot... And of course she was watching and, and she sent me a text and she is demanding. No, she's not. She's wonderful. She's delightful. Uh, but uh, her worship, Mayor Kathy Heron in St. Albert, absolutely uh, deserved recognition and, and my sincere apologies. Do you think uh, Jody Gondek would win if she ran in Calgary, assuming that Nancy doesn't run? You think that Councillor Gondek would have a have a good chance of winning? I think that a female candidate running for mayor in Calgary is the prohibitive favorite, uh, whether it's Jyoti Gondek or another candidate. Um, I think that Calgarians want a female mayor. Uh, they would have put in Barb Higgins in 2010, uh, but Barb didn't quite close the deal and uh, allowed Nenshi to do the big upset victory. Um, we're looking for a different way of approaching government. Uh, and it, it, it's really exemplified by Jason Kenney. You know, he's bringing a very masculine approach to government. You will do things my way. And uh, that's not working for uh, Calgarians right now. So I think that uh, a female mayor would be a great thing. I think that Jody Gundek, um, were she to run, I think that that would be a very interesting, uh, very interesting race because it's not like any of the male candidates are are jumping out and demanding our attention. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, Carter, can you do you have anything you got to do or can you stick around a little? I want to read some headlines here, but can we keep you around? I have nowhere to go. My, you know, I have nothing to do. I mean, okay. Merry Christmas. Okay. Let's promote the holiday special again. Okay. Yeah, the strategist. Are you talking, special. are you talking about the strategist podcast holiday special feeding, featuring oh, yeah. the music? We, we of... used to have the top rated independent podcast until the guy oh, named Ryan Jesperson yeah. came along and Sorry, fucking pal. stole it from hey, us. Hey buddy, you know what? A lot of athletes have, have forged wonderful legacies built on nothing but silver medals. And I encourage you to continue. <laughs> I encourage you to continue fighting. Uh, I'll continue to hoard the gold, uh, but there's nothing wrong with silver, pal. Um, okay, back That's with sweet. Stephen. Back with Stephen Carter in just a second. Love the guy, if it's not clear. Um, love beating him in poker more than anything, uh, but I also love talking politics with him. We're really grateful that our sponsors allow us to continue these types of conversations each and every weekday morning, and that includes the amazing team at Westworld Computers for more than 40 years. Their family has been serving Western Canadians with all of their... Uh, Sam, I never had... Do, like Mac, Apple... I know, you know, it's the it's the, it's the the iMac, but no one really says Mac anymore. People say Apple. What do you... I I mean, the company is Apple. Is Apple. The products are Macs. Macs. You get a Mac from Apple or an iPhone from Apple or an iPad from iPad. And I think you have all three of those things on your desk right now. See, Sam... You know what? You're going to get that's what that's a revenue share right there. You're going to get a revenue share for that because you did a great job on that spot. Yeah, so we'll say for all of your Apple needs, including Macs. Okay, we got it figured out. Go see Daryl and his team at Westworld Computers. Sales, service, they've got you covered, including right here in Calgary and Edmonton. We're also really excited to be partnered up with Clean Air Club because Sam and I can breathe easier each and every day that we're here in the Real Talk studio. They've got us set up with the air purifier and everything else. They did an audit for us, which we requested. Uh, But they reminded us that the biggest single thing that every single Real Talk audience member can do to improve your airspace where you are right now is to take a look at your furnace filters. Do it today. Go. It's they're, they're easy. You, you don't have to. There, there's no screwdrivers. I, I mean, unless your furnace is different. Than, but you, you can just pull it out and and it might gross you out because you think of this is the air. That it's running through there and it's going through the vents in your house. Furnace filters need to be changed, just like the oil in your car. And Clean Air Club gets you all set up at cleanairclub.ca. You tell them the size you need. They bring you all the replacements. They drop them off at your house. And they even include a gift from another local retailer that they're supporting. Check out cleanairclub.ca today. Let's take a quick look at the news before we get back to Stephen Carter.
Let's grab that Trudeau clip with Rosemary Barton. This uh, over the weekend, the prime minister uh, sitting down with uh, CBC's chief political correspondent. He was talking about this is the context of Bill Morneau and Bill Morneau resigning as finance minister and then as a member of parliament out of Toronto. And and maybe a little something slipped out. We're going to ask Carter about this in a second. Here it is. As as Bill said, uh, he was already looking towards new challenges ahead of next year's election, potent, the potential election next year. <laughs> so who knows? I mean, I don't know. We'll see what Carter thinks. Also, on a serious note, um, across Canada now, airports can be monitored more closely. Uh, restrictions on flights coming in from the UK, 72 hours worth ish, three days or so, as officials try to get a sense of what this new strain of coronavirus looks like coming out of Western Europe. It's unclear if it's more severe. It's unclear if it does anything to vaccine efficacy. Immunologists, virologists are saying, hey, listen, it's it's normal for viruses to mutate, so don't panic. But it's something they don't know a lot about right now, so they're keeping an eye on it. Uh, hundreds of travelers have returned to Canada, direct flights into Montreal, uh, Toronto, Vancouver over the past number of days from the United Kingdom. A reminder, uh, all travelers must self-isolate for 14 days. And the National Hockey League announcing January 13th that will kick off a shortened season, 56 games, and all seven Canadian teams will play in what they're calling the North Division. Sam and I are calling it the Great White North Division. Uh, the Oilers will play two teams 10 times. I have to assume one of those will be the Calgary Flames. They'll play four teams nine times with the top four in the division making the playoffs. Uh, Stephen Carter is a political strategist. And uh, what do you call yourself, a co-host? You're like... You're, I guess, a co. Although Zane Velge is kind of the host of strategists, and you're more the pundit. Yeah, we put the talent in the role. Uh, it's different than your show. Um, so by by making the talented person the host instead of the guests, yeah. it's uh, it changes the tone and tenor of the uh, of the actual per, you know production. Mm-hmm. One day you should try that having a a talented host. We found it. Very, very helpful. What we've realized is that if you go with if you if you go with a host that can just kind of minimum deliverables, like the MVP here, I'm the MVP of this show, um, which means minimum viable product. Um, I am the MVP. Oh, okay, I see. But it allows us to keep our costs down, right? You start bringing in oh, yeah. big shot hosts, all of a sudden your Patreon's got to be, you know, pushing you ten grand a month. It's you're not a big shot. Yeah, relatively I'm, speaking, I'm sure that like seventy percent of your revenue is going to Sam. I mean, that's got to be the way this is working. Sam's getting 70%. The Real Talk Beer Fridge is getting 30%. And we are derelict on, and negligent on all of our other accounts. Our power is probably going to be turned <laughs> yeah, off pretty pow- soon. Our power is going to go out any moment now. <laughs> hey, what do you think? You think that uh, you think Trudeau let it slip there? Or do you think it was kind of just a much ado about nothing? You think there's going to be a le- an election? Uh, like uh, some people are saying this spring. I doubt it. Uh, maybe next fall, like a year after the last one. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would... Uh, I've been counseling him against doing the 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 election uh, call earlier. You know, on our podcast, I've been saying uh, that uh, you know you just don't know how it's going to play. But if you look at the elections that have been held during the the COVID era, yeah. um, the campaigns uh, do do very well. So maybe it's it's my view is wrong. Maybe he should just call the damn election, uh, get a majority government, uh, allow there for four more years. Because uh, it's not like Aaron O'Toole is stepping up. Uh, Jagmeet Singh continues to be a, a disappointment, I think, for the for the NDP. So why not? Uh, what what could possibly go wrong? And and I think that that's where we are right now. Is uh, the Liberals have done the mental you know ca- math and calculus, and they've said, nah, may as well go for it. Uh, and the, the, yeah, the Prime Minister let it slip yesterday. I mean. It's relatively clear what's being talked about in the, in the offices of the PMO. So, Carter, like if there's anything I'm missing here, uh, let's clarify. But basically, the, the goal would be they'd, they'd want the mandate. They want to shake that minority hassle, right? They want a majority government. So if they're going to call an election, the assumption would be that they believe that they can win back or win some seats that they lost last October, correct? That's correct. I mean, John Kretchen wrote the book on this, right? Like call the election when you need the election. Don't call the election when it is prescribed. Uh, so Kretchen did a number of three-year terms. Uh, he, he could put himself in a majority government situation very easily. My counter to that is that Justin Trudeau gets to govern like he's got a majority anyways. Uh, Stephen Harper took this point of view, right? Stephen Harper had a mi- minority government, but he knew that no one was ever going to call the question. He was never going to lose a confidence vote because no one was strong enough to take advantage of it. Uh, and on top of that, if they were to force the election, 
um, they would probably lose. And this is the thing that I think Trudeau needs to really weigh. Uh, if he's the one who forces the election, will the Canadian electorate take it out on him or will they take it out on, on the other parties? And, and I don't know the answer to that. Anytime you go to an election, uh, you're taking a risk. Um, elections matter. This is the, this is my stock and trade um, is, is knowing that, you know, when I have the strongest candidate doesn't necessarily mean that's the easiest victory. Uh, and I don't know that the liberals are the strongest candidate uh, heading into, in, heading into this election. Uh, that looks like it's going to happen in 2021. This is, uh, it's, I don't want to be unfair in, in portraying what a, a party leader's uh, impact looks like by taking an outlying situation and saying, see, look, there you go. But I will say, uh, Aaron O'Toole's comments about residential schools uh, to students, uh, university students in Ontario, obviously landed with a thud and the conservative party issued a statement the next day basically i would i would suggest probably written for him that basically said i i said that they were intended to educate people of course they weren't they were poor and they were bad and they were poor and basically i'm sorry um what do you make of i mean that that to me a lot of people just said oh i saw someone say andrew O'Shear is at it again um indicating that there's really been no change in tone of leadership here but has aaron o'toole put his stamp on this party in a way that that you think is moving in a positive direction or how would you assess what you've seen uh, to this point so far from aaron o'toole well i think that aaron o'toole has like got two different sides to his coin and so on the one hand, he's trying to be the reasonable uh, electoral op, uh, you know, option, uh, for especially with the orange-blue shift, which is voters that vote NDP and then shift to the Conservatives, uh, which is a real big thing, especially in Southern Ontario. Uh, so you have that, that, that primary group that he's trying to appeal to, uh, so, but he's also trying to appeal to the right wing. So sometimes he looks a little bit leftist, and sometimes he looks a little bit right wing, and the voters, I think, at this stage don't know who he is or what he stands for. Um, so he's been very, very good from time to time. He's also been, as evidenced by the residential schools, very, very bad. Uh, and, you know, that actually sums up all of our political leaders at this stage. Some of them are really, really good. You know, all of them are really good sometimes. None of them have got a real solid um, practice that you can look at and say, oh, that's a very good elector, you know, a politician every single week. So you're a, I mean, you've, you've, you've managed campaigns, you've ad advised politicians at the highest levels, you're a political strategist. So if the conservatives want to win back government, uh, if the conservatives want to, uh, you know, I mean, you know, they, they pointed last October to the fact they said, Hey, look at all the votes we got. Look at all we, you know, we beat, we, you know, our votes are up more, more than the liberals and, and, and detractors or critics would say, yeah, I mean, so you won basically like every, you know, possible seat. You won everything in the prairies. Congratulations. You didn't win where you needed to. So the conservatives now, what they've got to do is either win Quebec, right? Or uh, win more ridings in Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, like metropolitan ridings, correct? I mean, that, so you got to do one or the other. So, so what is it and how do they do it? If you're advising Aaron O'Toole, what does the playbook look like over the next six months? Well, I think the playbook is very simple. Stop trying to win votes you've already won. Yeah, um, you've got the prairies. So stop doubling down on opposition to the carbon tax. Stop doubling down on on right wingism that you know that the the Michelle Rempels and Pierre Polyevs of the of the Conservative Party. You continue to put in the windows as people that stand for the Conservative Party. These are the exact same people that Andrew Scheer put in the window, uh, and Andrew Scheer was rejected by the the Canadian population. Stop putting them in the window. Instead, start looking at what a Conservative Party that can actually win in Quebec looks like. Uh, what a new Conservative Party can win in British Columbia looks like. You've got to win those votes. Uh, the reason that $170 a ton is coming forward from the from the Liberals is because that wins them more seats in Quebec. Mm. Um, Quebec is, you know, its electricity is primarily generated through hydropower. Um, they don't need to worry about coal the way that we worried about coal uh, back in the day. But even look at Alberta, we've shifted away from coal. Um, this is a brave new world that the conservatives need to recognize and present a vision for. I'm not sure that presenting a vision uh, for 15 years ago is a, is a winning electoral strategy if, if I'm uh, Aaron O'Toole. So he has the capacity to view, to put forward a vision look like in 2030 that rivals the vision of, of Justin Trudeau. It doesn't have to be doubling down on $170 a, a, a ton 
uh, carbon tax. Instead, he can start putting forward his own vision for what environmental sustainability looks like uh, for Canada. But instead, he, he's doubling down on, don't worry, we'll go back to oil and gas. That only works in two provinces where he's got all the votes. Yeah. It just isn't going to work. I've got, uh, there's another communication strategist and, and uh, political influencer that's watching us live this morning, Carter. And I don't know if she wants to be identified here. So I'll just I'll, I'll keep it anonymous. But she basically says uh, this is common sense from Carter. Uh, but why won't the conservative party be smarter? He is stating the obvious, but the party never listens. Why is their head up their ass? What would you say? Because the group of people that you need to win the leadership, right, is different than the group of people that you need to win the election. And whenever a party is out of step in those two issues, the party is weak. Uh, so the party is weak because they're out of step. Um, if you could win the leadership by actually appealing to people that will allow you to win the election, then you are strong, right? And that's what the difference. Why did Alison Redford win the leadership? in 2011 because we appealed to people that actually brought her the election in 2012 teachers that's the key right if you can't separate those two groups right and, and that is uh, electoral politics 101 it's a lesson that has been forgotten by the conservative party of canada and i don't understand it because i like winning winning is more fun than losing uh, i've done both uh and if i had to choose i would choose to win every single time uh which means you must get uh, not just more votes, but more votes where it matters. Um, I've got this interesting uh, note from Donna. We always we love when our audience members indicate what they'd like to hear more about. And Donna says, I would love to hear you guys talk more about equalization payments. Now, that is a very <laughs> broad. Uh, <laughs> see, see, this is this is what happens. But let me focus. And I don't know what Donna specifically wants to talk about with regards to equalization payments. But but let me throw something in front of you carter so alberta last week uh marks uh, it was a dark day when uh, dr dina hinshaw confirmed that for the first time uh, alberta was reporting 30 deaths due to covid 19 and uh we're hearing from uh er doctors icu doctors uh respiratory therapists nurses all on this show that are sounding the alarm and waving red flags and i out of curiosity w wanted to see what the premier had to say about it and i went on his uh, homepage, his Twitter profile, and and here it is. This is what he was tweeting about. Uh, our request for fairness is 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 you know, and we're not getting it. And and you know, Ottawa's turning its back on Alberta, and we're being ignored. And this is why we'll be holding a referendum to scrap equalization from the Constitution, October twenty twenty one. Like nobody cares. I don't mean nobody cares about equalization. I don't mean nobody cares about Alberta's relationship with Ottawa. That's not what I mean. But I mean, when 30 Albertans have just died from COVID-19 and the chief medical officer of health uh, looks more somber than we've ever seen her. And that's saying something. And ICUs are strained and nobody's going to be with their families for Christmas. Nobody gives a fuck about the referendum next October talking about equalization, which we all know is just, well, people are going to say I have a tinfoil hat on here, but it's drawing certain people to the municipal election. It's going to make sure there's voter turnout for me. I mean... It, what do you make of this entire thing? This referendum is going to cost millions of dollars and the results simply do not matter. Yeah. I mean, is there a bigger asshole in the world than Jason Kenney when he, when he you know, moves away, he pivots from 30 dead Albertans to a uh, fair deal for Alberta? Uh, I mean, a fair deal for those people is not be dead. Uh, so let's try and put things in perspective. Uh, secondly, <laughs> this is a ridiculous referendum. Uh, let's say that it passes, and it will. Okay. First of all, we should have a fair deal for Edmonton and a fair deal for Calgary referendums on those on those exact same uh, uh, plebiscites on the same elections. If City of Calgary Council doesn't put forward for Calgary referendum, they have their heads up their asses because the exact same thing happens from Calgary to Al in, into Edmond, you know, into Alberta government that happens from Alberta into the federal government. We pay more than our fair share. Same with Edmonton. We pay in way more money than we get back. Uh, the whole green line discussion that you were bringing up earlier wouldn't be an issue if the good people of Calgary actually just paid their taxes to Calgary. Uh, and you know what? I'm okay with it because it's fair. So when this referendum succeeds and Jason Kenney gets to wave it in front of Justin Trudeau's face, what's going to change? Not a goddamn thing. Not a goddamn thing. Justin Trudeau is going to go back and check with his Alberta caucus. What do you think we should do, guys? There's no one there.
there's no one there. So they're not going to do a damn thing. Well, and it, it turns out the people that make more money should pay more taxes. If, you, if anybody can show me the check from Alberta, the government of Canada, I'd be thrilled to see it. There is no check. You've been told a lie since Ralph Klein first told it in the mid 1990s. It was bullshit then and it's bullshit now. And uh, Jason Kenney knows it too, because he was one of the architects that designed this goddamn system. Well, we should have led with that. We should have led with that. I mean, that to me, is like, uh, like this was, it was fine when he was, when he was the Calgary representative, I think it was, it was like Southeast Calgary, Calgary, Midnapore, whatever his writing was. Um, he was fine with it. And he was fine with it as a senior member of Harper's cabinet. Harper was fine with it. The MP out of Calgary, the, the prime minister uh, out of Calgary, everybody was fine with it. And then now it's 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 insulting to Alberta and it's unfair and it's Ottawa turning its back and I would just like some consistency, right? Oh, consistency is all I ask. Immortality is all I seek. It's just not going to happen. Uh, this is this is uh, Jason Kenney being uh, at his most crass political self at, at and as you pointed out at a time when people are dying. Uh, and on top of that, the number one source of revenue in the province of Alberta right now is the government of Canada. Talk about biting the hand that feeds you right now. This is what's happening. The number one source of our revenue is the government of Canada. Jason Kenney needs to pull his head out of his ass and try and get along with people uh, and get, a, a, get us an equalization system that enables every Canadian, every Canadian to have the same standards of service across our great country. So let me ask you this in closing, Carter. You, I mean, you've been, you've been chief of staff for a conservative Alberta premier. You, you obviously live in Alberta. You work in Alberta. Um, this, uh, I mean, this idea that Ottawa is being unfair to Alberta. Um, and, I, and I already guarantee I'll tell you what's going to happen right now is I'm going to talk about things that are indisputable facts, okay? And it's, and it's going to be uh, portrayed by some partisans as an anti-Alberta smear or I'm an Ottawa apologist or this type of thing. But, but you tell me what's wrong about what I'm saying. So Ottawa has stepped up with uh, the emergency wage benefit, the emergency response benefit, loans to businesses when the Alberta government didn't do diddly squat. The Alberta government claimed that it had some relief program available. Mysteriously, uh, thousands of people were unable to sign up for the benefits. The benefits were not paid out. It's just been revealed a couple of weeks ago that Alberta has left about $350 million of relief on the table available from Ottawa. In other words, Alberta did not claim it. Ottawa bought a pipeline bought Northern gateway pipeline. Ottawa is, is plugging money into the province. Uh, like you said, uh, to the tune that we've never seen. And yet the assertion, and, and this is not some sort of, these are facts. And then the assertion is that Ottawa is turning its back on Alberta, that Ottawa is perpetuating unfair treatment toward Alberta. At what point do these accusations start to ring hollow? At what point uh, do even the most ardent supporters of this government look back and say, you know what, you keep saying it, but I'm actually just not seeing evidence that would support your claim. Does that ever happen? I don't think there's any way that we ever walk away from blaming Ottawa for our current situation. I mean, we blame the NDP for an oil and gas downturn that actually occurred during Jim Prentice's reign. Um, because it's easier to blame someone else than to recognize our own culpability uh, in not preparing for oil and gas volatility and ultimately the end of oil and gas as we've known it. And again, it doesn't matter if it happens this year, if it happens next year, it happens in 20 years. We all knew that there was going to be an end to oil and gas and we didn't prepare for it at all. We spent the royalties, we kept our taxes low, we, just, we, we tricked ourselves into believing that we were special because we were getting paid so much more money. Uh, we're not special. We had so much more money to spend. Uh, you know, my good friend Ken Bosengill always points out that the average teacher, the average nurse in Alberta gets paid so much more than the people in British Columbia. Why is that? Because we have more money to pay them. So we paid them more because we were all making so much more money. Um, our own failings are what we are blaming Trudeau for. Our own failings are what we blame Notley for. Um, and, and we have to stand up and be, uh, and be honest adults and look at our own behavior and say, what did we do wrong and what can we do better? Because if we don't, we are screwed. And that is the problem. This isn't going away anytime soon. If you blame Trudeau and you put in Andrew Scheer tomorrow, will anything change? No. You know how I know it won't? Because Stephen Harper put the equalization program that is in place 
in place. It hasn't been changed. It was put in place because it was the right thing to do. Stephen Harper did the right thing. Jason Kenney was standing at his side. They both should acknowledge it now and not play this, oh, poor me, I'm the poor little rich boy. You may not be rich as an individual Albertan, but I'll tell you something, all those big homes being built in Springbank don't just pop up. Those are rich people who make a ton of money who should be paying their fair share. And that's, that's the, the argument that we should be making right now is that everybody should be paying their fair share. And those disadvantaged Albertans that are getting screwed by this downturn should be able to pay less and uh, take advantage, you know, be, be able to be a, afforded the opportunity to get the benefits that the rich Albertans have been taking for years. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Mark with the fact check. I guess I, I didn't mean to, but I, I think I said that uh, the federal liberals bought Northern Gateway. Of course they bought TMX. Um, but this is uh Carter, I just like, this is, it sounds like something obvious. <laughs> it should be obvious. Um, I just want people focusing on facts, you know? I mean, I, I hope that's not too crazy of a Christmas wish, but what I a just, world that would be, I don't know, but I just, I just don't like to me, the, the 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 most frustrating thing when it comes to to subject matter around which people disagree and get very passionate about and, and get angry about in political debate and otherwise is 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 when it's when when people are being strung along and lied to by politicians that know better and and and, and that can that can come from across the political spectrum but I just to me. The, 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 the politics of division, which are on full display in the United States and in Canada and around the world in, in different jurisdictions, that's the most frustrating thing for me. Um, and I think that's why it's important that shows like this, guests like you, an audience like we have continues to bang that drum and insist on accuracy, insist on facts. You know, I mean, I went off at the end of last week um, and, I, and I posted a, a, a text I received from my brother about, you know, the, the premier of Alberta essentially saying that Serb is the reason, you know, the income support is the reason for so many opioid overdoses in Alberta. And it just like it, that, that kind of thing just twists my stomach uh, because the people are a lot of people are going to lap that up and, 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 and perpetuate that information. And uh, to me, it does a disservice to put it lightly uh, to our entire society. Well, I mean, there is nothing more powerful than the lie we wish to believe. Uh, the lie we wish to believe is the thing that, that will always hold us back from re achieving our true potential. And, and that's what's happening, right? We, we want to believe that it's the addict's fault that they're dying. I mean, and the truth of the matter is uh, this government has fundamentally changed our addictions policy and people are dying. Uh, the, the, the government didn't respond to COVID properly in, in a fast enough fashion and people died and they're dying today uh, because government and good it matters. And now Jason Kenney, seeing how badly he's fumbled this ball, is making excuses. Serb killed Albertans. Um, I responded as best I could with, with COVID. And then, oh, look over here. Alberta's being screwed by the federal government again. It's a distraction. Don't allow yourself to be distracted. Don't allow yourself to fall into this category of, of willful belief of that which we wish to believe. Um, when the truth is uh, is, is powerful. The truth will set us free. The truth will give us the ability to resurrect our great province. But if we continue to ignore our realities, then we will go nowhere, nowhere fast. Hey, Carter, you know, uh, Park Power, uh, you know, they, uh, they're a provider of electricity, natural gas, and internet in Alberta. They, they sponsor our hashtag, Real Talk RJ. And today, from their corporate account, uh, as a power provider, they're chiming in on the hashtag, and they say some honest and thoughtful discussion on Real Talk with Jesperson and Stephen Carter. Quote, we're going to have, they quote you, we're going to have to have a market-based solution to the climate. So you've got big power providers paying attention and listening in. Really appreciate you making time for us, pal. Wishing you and your family happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and I look forward to the next time our paths cross. This was great. Thanks very much for having me on, Ryan, and all the very best to you. And congratulations on being uh, the top-rated independent podcast uh, with the Strategist podcast coming in a a solid number two, solid yeah, number two. There you go. And I encourage everybody after you've listened to all of the real talk episodes and exhausted all <laughs> of our content to go check out the strategist uh, in all seriousness. It's one of my favorite podcasts. You guys do an amazing job, Carter. Thanks for this. Right. Thanks very much, Ryan. You bet. That's the strategists, of course. And that is one of the strategists, uh, as you heard, and he's done a lot. I, I you know, I sort of 
pluck uh, items off his CV to introduce him because it sort of gives you a sense of who he's worked for and what he's done and the fact that he knows what he's talking about. But he's the guy that got in the head and then she elected as mayor of Calgary. He was chief of staff to Allison Redford, and he's done a ton of other stuff as well. Stephen Carter knows what he's talking about. Speaking of Park Power, we're thrilled to have him on board uh, as the sponsors of our Real Talk RJ hashtag. As mentioned, a local power provider electricity natural gas and internet uh but local means a little something to different uh, a little something different to them it doesn't mean that like here's where you know a couple of our vice presidents work while the ceo is in the bahamas and our call center is halfway around the world uh-uh you're having a problem with services you have a question about services you want to sign up for services it's going to be in Albertan answering the phone And their commitment to community is so significant that they actually profit share with local charities. So we know you're going to pay for Internet. I mean, unless you're stealing from your neighbor's Wi-Fi because it's not password protected. Wouldn't it feel good to just get your own? You got to pay for power. You're going to have to get natural gas. Why not get it from Park Power? Why not support the local entity that's supporting Real Talk? We sure appreciate them. We're also really grateful for the team at Alta Moving and Storage. Now, as the name would suggest, they've... They've got a couple of things covered that fit together quite nicely. If you're considering a move, maybe you've got a renovation, you need to clear the place out. Maybe you're just painting and you got to put the stuff somewhere. They got these pod style containers. They can drop them off at your house. They can even provide movers if you need help loading or unloading that pod style container. And then, of course, they've got their longer term storage solutions too. locally owned, locally operated. You're sensing a theme here. You can check out the team at Alta Moving and Storage by checking out the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Look at that, Samuel G. Brooks. Two hours already on this Monday morning, and, and we're leaving a lot on the table. It was one of those days. Flies by. It was one of those days <clears throat> where we had so much we could have talked about. We really didn't spend a ton of time. Like I mean, we spent enough time as far as I'm concerned, but not as much as maybe some people hoped we would on this whole kid getting arrested down in Calgary on the outdoor rink story. Uh but I would say anecdotally, based on the comments we got on our YouTube, the comments on Twitter, it sort of seems like 85 to 90 percent of people thought that the kid for the most he's 21 years old. He's not a kid, but sort of questioned his actions more than those of the police. Would you agree? Anecdotally, based on what you saw, more people seem to. And, and it's not like people were letting the cops off the hook. Some were saying, ah, I don't know about the F-bombs. I don't know about having the taser out. Um one person wrote in to say, my buddy's a cop, and he said they should show that video on what not to do during an arrest. Maybe the cops would want to take some of that back. But generally speaking, it seemed like if people were picking sides, seems like the Calgary Police Service has more supporters here than Ocean Weisblatt, the kid. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, Stephen Carter said it best. He's an idiot. He's a, I called him an idiot or a moron. I can't remember. Probably both, uh, you know, interchangeably because that's his style. Um no, I think it's like, um, you know, again, context is everything. We remember that the police came and broke up a 40-person hockey game that was deliberately defiant of public health orders. And most people left per- peacefully. And this guy got his friend to turn on the camera so that he could make a stunt out of it. Like, I absolutely believe that, you know, like what Stephen Carter said, had that camera not been rolling probably wouldn't have been the same situation. They wanted to embarrass the Calgary police. Yeah. They wanted this to go viral. They wanted the rebel to pick up on this. You know what I mean? Like this is this plays so much into the playbook of the, you know, uh libertarian defy the covid regulations. I'm going to go play hot pond hockey cuz I want to. Like attitude. as though he's uh, sort of some sort of a freedom fighter. Like that's yeah. what they're, they're portraying it as now. I see that CTV is reporting. Let me give credit to the uh the reporter here that did this work. Uh this is Tyson Fedor uh, out of Calgary. Uh, or Fetter, perhaps, uh, Tyson uh, spoke with a Mount Royal University Justice Studies professor, uh, Professor Doug King of Mount Royal University, that just basically says uh, Ocean Weisblatt's going to want to get a good lawyer. He says he's a young guy that used bad, bad judgment, horrible judgment. Uh, he's now facing charges, right, and uh, obstruction of an officer and resisting arrest. Those are criminal charges. So this isn't, this isn't like, you know, you're going to get a $50 fine and be on your way. Uh, we're talking a criminal record if you're convicted. The funny thing is he probably would have got a fine and been on his way if he had just taken the ticket and left. Well, no, but I don't even, no, but he wouldn't have even got a ticket. They weren't, they weren't right. They just asked him to leave. He was just being a prick. 
right? They asked him to leave. He refused to leave. So, you know, I mean, people are pointing out. I do out. agree they should have towed his car. I think that would have been just mwah, brilliant. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think I think uh, Carter was on to something. I mean, with regards to, because someone's going to chime in and, and be correct and say, you know, what are they going to tow his car for? There was no, there's no impetus to tow his car if he's not parked illegally. You can't just have cops towing people's cars, which, you know, I'm sure, whatever. Although I have, if cops want to find a reason to hassle you, they can find a reason to hassle you, right? Window tint, lowered vehicle, exhaust. I mean, they can find something for sure. Um, but I think uh, Carter was bang on when he said, you just start giving everybody else tickets. Everybody that's hanging around loitering, every single person, you, driver's license, let's go. You, ID, let's go. You, let's go. Yeah, just let him skate around and burn himself out. He'll come off the ice eventually. Well, and it doesn't, yeah, I mean, you know, if he, yeah, I just, anyway, I, and I, I just, I, I hate to, I don't even like talking. You may have noticed, like, I don't engage rebel media. I don't like to say the words. We're giving them more attention now, even by talking about them than they deserve. You know, they've got this little, you know, incel puke, Key and Bexty that that does Ezra Levant's dirty work in Alberta. And here he is, you know, sort of sticking his nose in <laughs> like a like a dog. Have you ever seen the, you know, the dogs show up like a, a new person comes to your house? You're and being really mean. What's to the dogs. first thing that the dog wants to sniff? <laughs> they want the dog wants <laughs> wants to sniff the guest's butt to get a so that's how dogs learn about <laughs> that's Key and Bexty. <laughs> when he when he when he sees a story that the that the rebel can can hit up your great grandparents for cash for right and that's exactly what <laughs> there he is again uh i will say this if you've got rebel media backing you on an issue there is no greater indicator that you are in the wrong if ezra levant and kian bexty <laughs> jump to your defense immediately immediately pull back there is no greater end. This is a favor. This is free advice from all of us here at Real Talk as we wrap for the day. If those guys are in your corner, it's time to reevaluate like everything. So we'll stay on that story and find out what happens. We'll also take on more important news of the day, including a couple of segments tomorrow that we're really, really excited about. In the meantime, make sure you share this podcast with anybody you think that might have missed it but would enjoy it. And make it a great Monday. We'll talk to you again tomorrow, 8.30 a.m. Mountain Time.